everyone, <laughs> and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 274. We're all smiles because we're I'm giddy, punch, punch drunk, I guess. I don't know. It's just a happy day. We have a really special great co-host with us, guest co-host with us, which I'm going to have Adele introduce. I'm going to just say, hey, Javid, and I'll let Adele worry about the rest of, the, of all the introductions to this. As you can tell everybody else, Ben, Dean, Lily, I think we're going to have a few other pop-ins from what I got from the emails from everyone. Robert might make a Mr. Guest appearance, so... We'll see how that goes. But in the meanwhile, Adele, would you be so kind as to introduce our special guest co-host for this week? I would love to. Introducing Javid Barusha, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Infinito. And uh, they have a something that's new to me anyway. I'm, I, I, I'd love Javid to tell me uh, how new is it actually. But it's a virtual assistant revenue manager or revenue uh, virtual revenue assistant is that the way you say it javid it's the google assistant for revenue management <laughs> perfect well it sounds really interesting and i think a lot of people need all the help that they can get and uh to to use their time more valuable in a more valuable way than necessarily just pouring over reports so i'd love for you to tell us um about this new creation and uh, what it can do to help hoteliers. That's fantastic. Thanks, Adele. Sure. Um, so Infinito Solutions, uh, you know, we've been around for about 18 months, started in Singapore. We've got about 800 plus direct hotel partners in the APAC market. Uh, we're launching it in the US. We've got, you know, a, a pretty sizable sales team and we're growing. Uh, you know, the, the product was built around, you know, helping people be better at what they do, right? It's not recreating the wheel. It's not trying to put, you know, five different reports on your dashboard. None of that. It, it's it's what you do is making you more efficient. And, you know, we, we, started the, we started the process with that in mind, right? How do we take the day-to-day the -day hotel management aspect of it, you know, report generation, you know, digging through data every Monday to figure out what each of your hotels did, and you know how do we streamline it on streamline it on a platform that just makes it easier, right? So where you were spending three four hours trying to figure out what happened on the weekend uh, on a Monday morning, you know you know it's it's a click of a button away, right? Because the system does all the work for you. It's going to give you the recommendations. It's going to tell you what picked up, what days of the week, what what months in the year any hot dates, any you know, demand date in the calendar. And then you kind of, it, it gives you everything before you walk in the door. So it allows you to be more efficient when you're there at your property instead of spending you know, those three, four hours trying to figure out what happened. And you know that's the crux of the technology. And then we've got a few other things built into the back end from an AI perspective where we take the data as it stands instead of being a massive spreadsheet, you know, 10, 10 tabs long and, you know, 500 lines deep, and we take that and make it into a storytelling function. So even if your team transitions to another hotel, the data is still relevant and the new team or the new person can very easily understand what's happening from an on-the-book space and base growth standpoint. Can you give so, us an example of the storytelling feature? Yeah, so I mean, if you're looking at a, let's say you're looking at a spreadsheet and you're looking at, you know, 365 days out, uh, you know, and you click on, you know, one of the AI functions is you pick a date that you want to look at and the system will tell you, hey, you know, your, your, your pickup has been this, however, you're trending behind pace. You know, we, we track pace based on the last five weeks as opposed to last year because clearly last year is such a great indication right now. Uh, so, you know, we've, we, we track, so the system will essentially tell you where you are, where you need to be, and if you make certain changes, where you will end up. So it's not only giving you what you need to do, but it's letting you know if you do those things, if you take those actions, where will you end up being? And a, a lot of times when we speak to hoteliers, that's kind of the, again, having been in the revenue management space all my life, being able to cut a few hours of research time in my day would have been a blessing at any position I had in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the goal behind the technology. So back to your question, Adele, is we take every single item that you would have talked about 
let's say, you know, Monday morning, your GM's asking you, what happened over the weekend? What's your on the books? What's your forecast? What do you expect to pick up? Where are you ending the month? All of that is laid out in a simple English and understandable format. So all you have to do is sit in front of your computer and just click away, and it's going to give you everything that you need to tell somebody for that particular date and time frame. So did you it's made a favorite it drop in the link into the chat just so people can look at the site perhaps as you're talking yeah. a little bit. And I don't know, we're not on Zoom, but I'll have to say that we're bringing Zoom bomb. We have some strange faces to us. Um, Robert and uh, Trist. Um, I haven't seen them for God knows how long. So uh, let me introduce you to Java, Javid, Robert, Tris. This is the other guy from the other side of the pond I warned you about, just so you know. <laughs> I, I, I was forewarned about a couple of people. Now I'm going to see the faces. But, uh, so, so essentially what I was going with that is, and I will add the chat in a second, uh, Lauren. Um, sure. In the, so what I meant by we make it easier and help people get better at it, it's, uh, this the data is is available right it's only it but it's available in different pms systems and different rms systems so we take all of that data and put it into a dashboard so if you had let's say a, a portfolio with multiple brands you don't need to go to five brands to figure out what each hotel did we bring it all to you in one database um and that for an owner operator management company uh, you know, it comes in handy when you're looking at multiple hotels and trying to make quick decisions. So what is it doing in order to bring your eyes straight to the problem uh, or opportunity? Um, instead of having to look at all the days, I think that's what you're saying, that instead of having to look at every single day and just crawl through, you know, analyzing it that way, it'll bring to your attention something that's new and different and needs to be changed. Is that right? Correct. So the system's not only going to tell you what your performance is, but it's going to tell you your performance was great, but you could have done better if you did these things, right? Or if you're looking forward, it's going to give you that explanation as well. So that's one. And, and when you talk about highlighting, when we're looking at the uh, portfolio function for purposes of discussion, uh, you know, it'll give you a roll up for the entire portfolio at the top of the page, and then it's going to give you an individual breakdown for each hotel for whatever time frame you selected. So you can then see within that date range which hotels were successful and where your opportunities were. So if you were a regional overseeing a portfolio, you'd know Monday morning these three out of my 15 hotels are the ones I need to focus on first, rather than, you know, looking at one at a time and then figuring out oh, my problems are here. So it how, allows you to streamline that. How does it work? Do you get an alert or do you uh, check your app on your phone? How, how is it that you are notified when something is happening? So the, the program is completely app friendly. I mean, we have an app, we have a uh, website, uh, but more importantly, we send you an email three times a day telling you where you are at any given point. So let's say, you know, we sent you an email at 7 in the morning, said your pickup was this. We'll send you another one at 12. Then we send you another one at 3. So you know throughout the course of the day what you've picked up, right? Mm -hmm. You know, my biggest challenge as a as a revenue leader at my previous jobs was, you know, if I wasn't looking at the data throughout the course of the day, I'd never know what my, my changes were. I'd have to wait till the next day to run my on-the-books report and then, you know, compare the two reports and say, oh, well, great. I picked up, you know, X, Y, Z rooms uh, over the next couple of days. But now we are making it, we're sending you the information saying on November 20th, you picked up 10 rooms. You know? So and we, we do that for the next 365 days out. So generally speaking, hoteliers, you know, we don't look at, in a normal day, we don't look past 30, 60, 90, right? This makes me look at, you know, maybe November of next year or October of next year because something just picked up, a concept got announced, I didn't know about it, right? And now I'm seeing rooms being booked. So mm -hmm. it's not only shown on your app or your website, it's also shown via email. And then as we develop the technology more, there is a little bit more AI that's going to get laid into even that, that reporting aspect of it. I'm interested in what you said about... Uh that it'll show you not only how you did, but what you could have done better. But how would it know if you would have even achieved that had this 
circumstances change. So we're looking at the five week pace, right? So we, instead of looking at and comparing it to last year, we're looking back five weeks and saying, you know, for the last five you know, Sundays or whatever it is, you priced this way and your outcome was this, right? So if this Sunday you're trying to lower the rate, the question is why, what's changing? Right, because there is no indication in the system that there's any change in the market. Right, from a competitive price point to your price point, there doesn't seem to be any differences between the last five Sundays. So why is this Sunday different? Mm -hmm. Right, and again, the system is giving you the recommendation based on pace. That does not mean you can't make your own decision, but this is based on actual analytics from the system itself. I and mean, since we mapped to the PMS everything that we're pulling is real time from the PMS system. That, that was a question I was going to ask actually, is how you're getting your data. And obviously from a CRS or PMS, what systems are you integrated with and to get that from? So we have, we are integrated with 23 different PMSs at the moment. Uh, and you know, and as we, <laughs> it, it's funny, I didn't realize there were that many PMS systems to start with, right. but <laughs> as, as, I, as I speak to more and more hotels, I seem to be learning new systems pretty much every week, right? So the way we are addressing it right now is we have our core 23 PMS systems that we work with. Um, and then, you know, once we identify a new one, you know, then we of course work with the partner and, you know, try to figure out if the, the reporting capabilities exist. If it's a cloud-based system, it's not a problem. Uh, you know, again, it, it'll take us a little bit of time, but in our case, because we've got the script ready to go, integration takes maybe 24 hours and you're live within between 24 and 48 hours. So it doesn't take us weeks to, to set this up, as long as the PMS system is compatible with what we have. What about on the brand side, Javed? Are you integrated with all the major brands, Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, and IHG? So we are currently, I am currently testing with Marriott and Hilton. Uh, the caveat is you know, those two brands have a two-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to, that's a research, research project on my end at the moment. We're trying to figure that out. But uh, with the others, yes. So do you have to pay for an interface from the PMS side uh, in order to do this? Because that can be very expensive. No. So we run a script from your reporting platform. So let's say we pick IHG, for example, they use Opera, right? Mm -hmm. We would we would build a report scheduler in the back end and then run that as needed. So we run the report every hour uh, and we do segmentation every four hours, a room type pickup every four hours. So we try to give you the freshest data possible. As you kind of grow your presence in the US and other areas, do you foresee any trouble with bringing data in once an hour once you reach a certain mass like in terms of having to upgrade your servers or things of that nature so in the current environment we're doing that obviously globally uh, about 800 plus hotels so we haven't run into that problem just yet okay. um, I, I am sure it is something that will come up but i i i, I couldn't answer that right now because we're, we're having we haven't gotten there yet gotcha um, Javid, so far, the people that the hoteliers that you've worked with so far, are they is 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 the general manager using it? Uh, by the way, there is an app. Is that is that correct, or is it just a report? Like, there is something that shows up here that was yeah. what I had understood. Did I misunderstand that? No, it's completely mobile friendly. Yes. Okay, so so is the GM using it? Is the director of sales and marketing use it? Is it rev reservations or is it just revenue managers that are using it? Actually, it's all of the above and owners operators, right? Because from a from an owner's perspective, you know, we the report can be sent to any amount of stakeholders. So the hotels mm -hmm. that are using it now are not just uh, property level GMs, DOSs, RMs, or sales leaders but is also being used by, you know, VPs of revenue or VPs of sales at the corporate level who can then keep an eye on the properties. And then from an ownership standpoint, you, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say this, but I'm going to apologize ahead of time, right? Forecasting is, is kind of like looking into a crystal ball. Um, and from an owner standpoint, you know, when, when, when they want to figure out what's happening, they, you know, the, the chain is, 
the owner goes to the management company, the management company goes to the GM, and then so forth, right? And then it works its way back up to uh, the owners. In this, in this environment, we can give the data directly to the ownership group through the same email chain so that they have the most up-to-date information on each of their properties as well in a roll-up format. So it wouldn't be an individual report per hotel, but it would be a roll-up saying, this is what the portfolio did for whatever time frame it is. So everybody can get access to the information. And would it also give the owner suggestions? We, no, it wouldn't. It would only give the property folks suggestions, but I'm sure if, uh, if uh, I'm, I, let's just say if the owner wanted the suggestions, yes, it can be made possible. I'm sure they don't want to see the entire portfolio, <laughs> but it can be done, yes. It can be included in the report for it. Okay. Um, I, I have a question, Adele, if I can just uh, bob in. Um, Javi, given that uh, large parts of, of the hospitality industry are still experiencing a reasonably challenging time, given the, the C word, um, what are the benefits to uh, an AI platform like this versus uh, relying on other methods, try, trying to put cobble this together manually or trying to look on outdated, trying to rely on outdated data, data that doesn't really exist anymore? Well, it's twofold, right? In the current environment, especially in the US, with with you know a few positions being furloughed and people on layoffs and things like that, you know, GMs, DOSs, RMs are wearing multiple hats, and in some cases, RMs are overseeing almost twice the size of the portfolio they were pre-pandemic. Uh, so again, the goal here is if they were using Excel, you know, mm -hmm. you can get away from that because now the data is readily available. You don't have to sit and look at Excel to figure out. What you are, what you moved for the next 365 days, because the system is going to give it to you at a click of a button, and and the idea again is to be more effective and more efficient. Uh, instead of spending hours trying to figure out where the data came from, we're just going to hand deliver it to you by your hotel. Does it give you any information about like the rates available in the market? It will, yes. Yeah. So we, we work with BI tools like OTA Insight, Rate360, so, and we connect with them. So we would be able to give you a comparison about where your pricing is, where they are, and what you should do from a pricing and ranking standpoint. Uh, and, and then again, if you don't have those tools, we can figure out other ways. But uh, the, the pricing is derived from the BI mechanism. I see. So it you, it works with the tool. If you have that tool, you can you can hook it up. You can hook it up. And in some cases, if you don't have that tool and you're a smaller property or independent hotel that doesn't subscribe to a tool like that, we can do a screen scrape from Expedia Ref Plus. So what are people saying so far about the service? You said it's been is it eighteen months? Eighteen months. Uh, I mean our. The feedback has been good. I mean, I think the challenge we're coming across now is, you know, as people start using it, everybody wants the tool to get customized, right? So now we're at a point where, you know, Lily wants one thing, Adele wants another thing, Javid wants another thing, and then, you know, how do we fit that into the pipeline? So we're, it's not a major issue. I mean, it's all great initiatives, right? But at, at some point, it's going to be what impacts the masses, what impacts us by scale. So. It, it hasn't been a, a challenge in, in, in the work environment sense, but it has been from a development standpoint. So, you know, we are looking at integrating more AI. You know, you know I think I may have said this to you last time I spoke to them, is, you know, incorporating like a, a projection function into the system, you know, doing things that will, you know, really help each hotel, whether they're a part of a portfolio or individual. Is it, is it something that you can try for a short period of time? In, in the U.S., yes. In the U.S., any hotel that wants to try it, we're offering them you know, you know, 30, 45 days trial. They can give it a shot, try it, use it. You know, we'll set it up for free. No commitments at that point. And then, you know, we can go from there. And, you know, in Asia Pacific, our conversion from trial to live has been about 94%. So, uh a lot of times, you know, once once you get hooked on it, and, and because you know, again, think about it this way, and I, I, you know, I always bring it back to me is, right? If I had this information before I walked into my hotels every Monday, I wouldn't spend the next four hours of my Monday trying to figure out what happened. I would already know it, so I could immediately challenge my RMs and say, 
why didn't your hotel you know not make forecast budget it doesn't make any sense you were projecting to do it what happened right? and that conversation typically happens later in the afternoon after i figured out what happened over the weekend but you know now if i had this i wouldn't have to do that i'd have everything ready to be available and how is the pricing? Is it uh, per per room? It's per room, yes. Per room, per month. You know, uh, Robert's report, now uh, the Rock Cheetah report, <laughs> I should say, uh, showed that a lot of companies are having, you know, 29% occupancy, 50% occupancy from the, and that's from the third quarter, which I assume is better than previously. So, so... I, I, I'm always asking uh, suppliers, you know, can, what are you doing to accommodate that? Because obviously a 500 room hotel isn't a 500 room hotel if they have 35% occupancy, right? I mean, yes, true in the current environment, right? Um, yes. And, and, you know, and to be honest, I mean, we're flexible, right? I mean, if it's a, if it's a discussion about price point versus somebody trying and using it, I can be flexible. That's not an issue, right? If if you need if you need some help carrying you through till next year, okay, we can have that conversation, right? Yeah. With, with with a with a forward looking commitment. Right? Yeah, so that's okay. That's part of this yeah. partnership, right? Um, but I think in sorry, Adel, but I think mm -hmm. the one point to remember now is even if you're running at twenty nine percent, but you're still covering multiple properties, you still need to be more efficient. In, in whatever scenario you are, because if you're a GM doing that, you know, you would rather spend your time doing your guest relations, working on your customer satisfaction, doing other things, maybe even cleaning rooms in this, this environment, right? So there's other things you could be doing rather than trying to figure out you know, what happened you know, in the last 24 hours. Well, that's uh, the, the, the free trial sounds like a great way to start and see if it's right for you. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of hotels have taken us up on it. How, right. Sorry, how long does it start? How sorry, how long does it take to get uh, up and running? Like a, from first contact to to seeing the first sort of uh, assistance between, between you know, I can I can set you up if we go live, let's say today, or I can set you up right this afternoon, and you can be ready up and running in the next twenty four hours. Nice. Damn. <laughs> well, I don't know. That's just a little slow there, to me. There's, I, I, there's I, one caveat, right? <clears throat> we, 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 should, we should have the capability with the PMS. So if we are, if you're one of those 23 that we connect with, it's quick. If it's one that you don't connect with, then we need to go back, you know, get the username, password, do a kind of match up our reports with the technology, and that takes about a week or so. So if you're one of the 23, it's quick. If you're not, it takes a little bit longer, about a week or so. So, Javid, I'm curious because one of the things that has really come up when it comes to technology in the midst of this after talking to so many hoteliers is that uh, a lot of the existing RMS solutions out there like Ideas and Duetto and whatnot really struggled in the face of the sudden changes that happened with COVID-19. And generally speaking, they'll need to kind of learn the data uh, before they're spitting out accurate recommendations for a period of at least six months of consistency, right? Like some sort of whatever we feel is like consistent going forward. Have you been able to bridge that with your technology or where do you see the intersection of human touch versus the automated recommendations? So it's twofold, right, Lily? So we're, we're still looking at last year as a kind of as a guide, but unfortunately last year doesn't do much for us at, th at this point. So when we when we give our recommendations based on the last five weeks, which in the current environment would still be would still be COVID period, right? So yeah. the recommendations are based on the last five weeks. Now the system is pulling data from the PMS, so it's the most real time information. There's really no learning of the system that's involved in the process. Where the where are some of the other systems that you referred to? I mean, it does take time for the system to learn what's happening and then kind of make the decisions accordingly. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say for, for Ben and Tristan with the UK shutting down, basically with the lockdown, um, 
Yeah, none of the systems are uh, are figuring that out at this point, right? Because it wasn't anticipated. It wasn't like the last five weeks, and everyone's now just trying to figure out what happens after December second, right? Well, uh, <laughs> funny you should mention that, Robert, because uh, obviously the lockdown has been um, the lockdown has been extended to December the second. Yeah. But yesterday, the Chancellor of the Exchequer stood up in the House of Parliament and said. We're going to extend the furlough scheme until March 2021. And everybody oh. said, hold on, buddy. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on. That doesn't add up. This, <laughs> this stinks, guys. We're going to, you're extending the furlough scheme to then, but you are swearing blind. This is only a four-week lockdown. This is fishy. And then they were like, oh, look, it's bonfire night. Here's some fireworks. I was like, all right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so let let's not uh, let let's not hold our breath for uh, a, you know a, a bursting free of our confines on December the second. But you're right; it's it's interesting how how platforms AI or Excel based uh, are going to handle and react to these sort of last literally last minute knee jerk decisions. It wasn't until right. yesterday, li literally yesterday, that the House of Parliament passed the motion. So you have eight you have about eight hours to prep for this and go well. There goes November. Right. <laughs> but again, think, people are going to be used to from doing that. In some Sorry, strange Mark. ways, and I may mean this in a positive way, not in a negative, and certainly no net disrespect to any platforms that are out there, including the ones we're not talking about today. Um, until we integrate market demand cycle to the data integration that we're talking about, the use of historical, current, and future tense, but the data constraint where you get to point out to say, uh, you know, we, we use it in revenue sense of constrained demand or something like this, but in marketing sense, it's channel shut off. Guess what? You're not getting this segment of business because of whatever reason, whether it be legalities or whatever, you're shutting this off. What happens? And until you have that integration, I think from a, from a software point of view that says, add me the market aspect, demand cycle, channel contributions, channel value, to what you're asking me, and I'm saying this from the context of the software, what you want me to tell you, the accuracy is going to be skewed on basically saying, based on everything I know and everything you're telling me, this is what I think. But meanwhile, as pointed out, guess what? We just shut everything off. The number just goes, you know, as you said, ripped and tossed. It's like it means nothing at this point. It's hypothetical BS. Yeah. So until we add that segment to it, the marketing component of it, we're still going to deal with one leg out of a three-leg race on this. Well, yeah. on the eight Oh, go ahead, Abdel. Oh, I was just going to say, TripAdvisor just came out with the spotlight where they took what the OTA Insight gives, which is pretty fabulous, and and uh, added to it their market demand information. And uh, obviously, it's a huge travel website with a lot of data information. And I'm just going to be so curious to see uh, what impact hoteliers really feel that it's giving them? Is it giving them an edge or is it just more, you know, noise? I, I, I don't think you can guess until, until you actually try to apply it to your life. I'm so curious as to how they've done that, given um, how uh, our interactions with TripAdvisor have been and their back-end systems. Getting something that's shiny and fancy like OTA Insight and then basically mashing it into Excel uh, is, the, is, is what I've got in my mind. And I'm just like, hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure you know, from what we've been told that TripAdvisor... I think that's putting a bridle on a race car, but that's just me. Yeah, I <laughs> totally agree. Totally agree. But, well, I am curious to see what they've done because I, was, I raised a very large eyebrow to that one, indeed. I would say, though, from a, from an information point of view of, of historical or what I call forensic review, I think accuracy is very much there. Why did we end up where we did at the rate we did compared to our comp set that we did based on the demand that was in market? I think those are completely valid point makes that, 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 that the softwares of all types right now can make. It's the future tense that I keep saying is there needs to be more uh, alternate data inputs that are not right now reflected in the, from the marketing segmentation. I know from a revenue management presentation, demand, demand cycles, rate, rate, rate resistance, rate parity, uh, constraint, rate, demand to market, and all this stuff are in there. But it's the, guess what? You just had uh, the PM go over and shut off anybody traveling to your area. Woof. Okay. You know, uh, or you're saying that only certain segments of people can travel, you know, uh, essential travel and so forth. What does that translate? You have to translate that into a number for it to be used. 
how do you translate that? What what is the con the quantified amount of of that market segment going to mean to you? Is that only certain rates, government rates, essential negotiated rates with certain groups and organizations that you have already set established? And if so, what's the full demand of that so that you can calculate that into what you project forward as revenue? Those things I don't think have yet to be introduced into the process cycle that we're talking about to a great degree. Well, even simpler things like weather forecasts, like is it supposed to be sunny this weekend? Is it gonna be rainy this weekend? Guess what, that does impact the people to decide, hey, I wanna go somewhere or stay in. Says the man from Nebraska talking to the man from Florida who has earth control <laughs> yeah. every day. <laughs> Number 29 is coming. So I'm curious also, Javid, on your, on your roadmap as we look at all of these different things, do you have a plan to incorporate profitability metrics into this going forward? Because I feel that that's a big gap right now in technology. Um, so being able, even if it's at a high level where people can say, okay, I'm going to hand enter what my margin is on Expedia versus booking versus price line and then you draw some you know generalized conclusions about how to strategize or is this system uh, like the others based more on top line revenue no there it's not there yet but the next iteration of this is going to have a labor model it's going to have a profitability model in there uh, and again it, it's it's we're going to have it on the back end right so the, the hotel can choose to like you said, you know, pick, you know, let's just pick Expedia for an example. Do I want to participate in Expedia? And if I do, you know, what is my my profit per room going to be like? Uh, or if I wanted another channel, so that is that is in route in development, but it's not out yet. But I think the first piece of development is going to come out, and it's going to be more in line with the system projections, right? So based on what we've seen for the last five weeks, where do you think, let's say, December is going to end? So the system is going to give you that. And then, of course, you have to do your own forecast to figure out whether that makes sense. But we're going to incorporate a few things you know, that I would have used on a date on a weekly basis to you know, talk to senior leadership in my company. And, pl and please understand when, when, when my comments were about this, it wasn't to be uh, a, a dish on so software. As exists. Now, I look at it as like we get to talk to you at the forefront of you bringing something to market as you're adding things to it. We're going, hey, I got an idea. That's what you're doing. I'm taking notes of your idea. I am taking notes of your idea. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. See, I'm not normally negative or critical unless it comes to Ben and Tris. That's really pretty much <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I think it's more Ben or Tris. I don't think there's an and in there with that. Yeah, one. you know what? You're very right, Tris. You have been my favorite for I don't know how long, really. Just, you know, <laughs> it's the beer. I'll, it's got to be the beer. It's just not the same when we don't have the accents on the show. <laughs> yeah. Robert's, really, tried, Robert's tried to do a, a Scottish accent, and he does, never pulls it off when he's here. <laughs> you know those guys are originally from Brooklyn. Right. <laughs> Scotland. Oh, God, it's crap. Oh, man. You so I have to, um, oh. I, I'm only able to stay for about 15 more minutes, but Javid, I wanted to see from your perspective, kind of even broader than the technology that you're working on, obviously there's been some setbacks in the revenue management field in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there's been a lot of furloughs. There's a lot of people who are trying to tighten their belts in areas that maybe we don't always think are advisable. Uh, sales, marketing, and revenue management typically are, are what's generating revenue. So to try and condense those can sometimes be uh, dangerous. So, and with that, a lot of people just cut their revenue managers altogether and said that they didn't see the need for revenue management while the hotel was closed, even if they were anticipating opening in 30 days. And let's all hope the revenue managers listening to this are managing further out than 30 days. But um, just kind of globally, you know, what are you seeing in in regards to attitudes regarding revenue management? Are people trying to purchase the solution to replace people, which I think from your comments, you tend to agree with our standpoint that it's not possible to completely replace the human element in revenue management. Um, you know, just kind of what do you see as what's gonna happen with this discipline in 2021? So my response is a very selfish one. Uh, having been in revenue management, it is my pride and joy. I love it. Uh, I don't think you can replace a revenue manager. You can't replace the human touch, but you can make it efficient, 
right? So a, a RM that is maybe working on more of a portfolio than he or she was pre-COVID, uh, instead of you know having them struggle for you know 13, 14 hours a day, whatever the day it is, and if you can make it easier on them to get the data, they have more time to spend on strategy. And I think I think that is key because if you can't look past the next 30 days because you're so so busy firefighting to the tomorrow, uh, you know you, you're never going to be able to see what's coming next, right? And in in the in the current environment, I think looking past 90 days is is difficult. But if we were to give you that information, saying you know you don't have to look at every other day, just look at these five days in the future that have seen movement and make the adjustments, you know, that still keeps you ahead of the game. So I think to your point, Billy, based on the people that I have been, I have been speaking to across the United States, including Hawaii and Alaska, I think replacing the RM is not a solution, uh, is not their first op option either. Uh, and they are, a lot of people are bringing them back, but I think it's, you know, how do we make them, I think the term is a utility player. Uh, is, is what people are using the term as, right? You can have an RM that, you know, maybe doing a little bit of work on the sales side, a little bit of work on the app side, doing some RM work, and kind of being able to multitask in the current environment until things get to steady state. Well, and one thing I have seen with, with conversations with some, some owners and REITs and things like that, um, revenue managers are going to be under intense scrutiny to prove their ROI. I mean, it's because a lot of the firms are looking at now going, okay, this is bad. We're doing this, but adding this additional head back, what is the incremental ROI, right? And there's going to be a lot of hes hesitancy to add those heads unless that there's a clear green light and this is a no, you know, no brainer. So I think you're right. I think it's going to be wind up being in the risk for, for really looking at discipline and, and moving it forward is going to be, well, yeah, we'll do it with a utility infielder and it winds up being a part-time. It's it's now 30% of somebody's job or 70, 60, whatever that ratio winds up being with a with a bunch of other stuff. And uh, yeah, that it could get messy. Mm. Um, I, I, I agree pandemic. with you, Robert, because I think that sometimes uh, leading up to this, and we saw the same thing in 2009, right? There was a culling of revenue mm -hmm. managers who were not really at the top of their game. They were right. just like benefiting from the wave of positive economics, right? So yep. these kinds of events really clear out the kind of chaff from the gold here. Mm -hmm. So it's it's important that hoteliers are paying attention to what does your revenue manager really no. And also, um, you know, if, when we're going beyond pricing, revenue managers need to approach their jobs now, not as a list of tasks, not as like an assembly line factory worker. I do this, I add it to this piece and I do this. I come back tomorrow, I do this, I add it to this piece. And I, you know, we're not going to get anywhere with that kind of thing. We're just going to be on this constant kind of looping conveyor belt. So, oh, oh no, if you want to be replaced by an algorithm, that's exactly right, what exactly. you Exactly, yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, but I think we need to be looking for more of that ownership mentality, almost like a CEO mindset within the revenue managers where they're actually looking at it and making critical strategy decisions and they can say, okay, here's where we need to go and here's everything we need to do between now and then to achieve it and really honing in on their strategic mindsets. You, the other thing you I will appreciate this happens. before you go, Lily, because I, as a you know, confessed marketer, was in a very heated defense discussion of the retaining of a revenue manager at the corporate level. Uh, where I, I had this, I had this great relationship with the client, and they said, "Listen, Lauren, we're looking at what we need to do. We know that we need to keep doing marketing, but we may have to be cutting other costs. We're thinking that we have to rechange our corporate structure. We're thinking about temporarily not having revenue management." You're thinking, "Hey, save me, kill them." Yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> and actually, I was I was the reverse of it because I, I, I you know, me and analogies, I said. So if you're sailing a boat, if you you want to throw the navigator overboard, sure, you got the sextant and the compass and everything else they were using, but do you know how? Are you just going to go which the direction of the wind blows? Right. Because without a revenue manager, all you're doing is following wherever you think the business is going. You're going to follow other people's revenue rates. They're going to follow, well, they, they we're getting business from here, so we're going to have to offer this. Who's coordinating that? Who's telling you we need to get over here for total KPIs or what have you or goals? If you don't have that in place, 
you're rudderless. You're just basically kind of going wherever the thing's going to push you, wherever the demand is going to pop up in market, whatever the rates you think are going to be in comparison to your market. You're just going to flow with that. And nobody's going to wave a flag and go, uh, dudes, we're supposed to go over that away. Wins that way. So tack a little bit and go that way. You're not going to have that person. And I said, as a caveat to this, and this is to their revenue manager's credit, they're integrating what marketing is giving them as information. So they're being more accurate about telling you what should be done rather than just, oh, yeah, let's lower the rate. We can get more business. That saves my job. No, Make, maintain the rate because marketing is telling me we got this channel of demand over here. We can hold the rate. So, as you said, Lily, smart revenue managers that aren't just sitting there going square peg, square hole, next square peg, square hole, but are actually being creative and constructive and using resources, they will have the survival about this process. And to your point, David, about your software, this isn't a replacement to somebody. It is if they're algorithmic, as Robert said, but if they're if they're really trying to find more methodologies of having better insights, your tools are critical. Right. It's like, look, I have a little forward sight here, maintain rate or maintain this because we're gonna be doing this, we know it's coming from here or whatever. So, yeah. The other well, thing that driven managers are going to have to start doing, well, I shouldn't say start doing, but they're going to do more of, is cross training into other disciplines. Even before COVID, we started to see that bleed over of reservation revenue managers getting into e-commerce and digital marketing and so on. That was starting to happen then, it's happening way more now. And, and I think that's gonna be a necessary blend of the two, uh, partially to justify the position, but also partially because the two do go hand in hand. Uh, so I, I, I think the yeah. cross training and having multiple disciplines, you know, and if nothing else, go learn how to do the front desk. Right. Make sure that you have multiple things that you can do within the organization, not just this one thing. Yeah. And I think, you know, because I don't have time to expound today, I have dropped in an article I wrote on this topic uh, for Hotel Executive, actually, where it talks about the foundational skills that revenue managers are going to need to have in the future. So hopefully that will be helpful to any revenue managers who are listening. No, your uh, podcasts and white papers are never constructive. They're usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have, uh, a, after a little delay, we do have our new podcast episode coming up uh, today, I think, right, Lauren? It'll be up today. Download. <laughs> I never want to face the wrath of Julie. Never, never, never want to be on the wrath <laughs> I listened to you uh, this morning, Lily, on my four mile morning walk. Ah, oh, thank you. You're, you're so so excellent. You. It's just full. It, every single moment is an idea, a tip, something good to do. It's very good. Thank you. I appreciate it. And with that, I am signing off for today, guys. Hi, Lily. Have fun saving the world. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. <laughs> oh, we got to tell you where you can find Lily, too, at TCRM Services and at uh, Thanks yeah. for Better Presence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seamless, Anyways, seamless. I know, right? I am such the quality host. <laughs> the, the only thing I would say, like Bob, I tell you, Bob. Ben. <laughs> well, thanks, Jack. Uh, the only thing I would say about revenue managers um, uh, widening their skill set is you can you can either. You can't do both. If a revenue manager in, 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 in these tough, tougher times has to take on more properties in a group or is spread thinner than they were before, how much really are they going to, how much opportunity and time and attention are they going to have to broaden their skill sets into perhaps e-commerce and digital marketing? Mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea if you, if you can focus on one particular hotel, one ecosystem. But if you're dragged, if you're doing an RM job across, say, three or four hotels in a small group or in a region, are you going to have the time to learn how the digital market e-commerce uh, pieces fit into that? I just well, that, That's very true, but the fact is you will be. Right. But people are going to be asked to do more. And, and that's where things like Java's program come into play, actually. Yeah. I've got to do more. So I've got to find a way to make those things exactly. more efficient. Having a program yeah. like Java's is a, is a key linchpin of that. Yeah. So the words right out of my mouth, buddy. And you, you'll find as well then that, you know, the point that Lauren was making about the integration of digital marketing into revenue management. If that does happen in the marketplace, then we will start to see more people like Javid actually producing things like that because the market wants it and there's you know there's money there to be had for it you know at the moment perhaps not quite as much we can all see it going that way but um uh, right at this moment in time yes it's useful but it probably isn't demanded but i think it is going to be a matter of time mm.
Yeah. And, it, and it will require quality dashboards that don't just tie into the PMS, but they tie into Lamarck and they tie into external signals from a variety of other systems. And I really think the key is going to be for the revenue managers to figure out what are the important signals? What are the ones that are, yeah, they're not important or we're getting signals, but that's a crappy data source. That's unreliable data because of either the way it's structured or whatever it's been processed so many times by other intermediaries it's not it's not useful so yeah there's a wealth of opportunity again, again the caveat being the integration capability i know firsthand that as certain people are looking at other reporting sources and they consider you know ota inside which is great and of course there's you know travel uh, um, travel click has their own integrations and everybody else has it everybody has their thing um but they're also, they don't talk to each other as well, or they don't pull it. And you end up doing a redo of what you're already trying to cut down. And that is, I gotta look at this report, but it doesn't talk to this data. So I gotta look at this data because that report doesn't include it to see if it influenced what I just saw on that day. It, it really requires taking the ability to take what is needed from each of the sources that are providing these things and, and create almost a meta capability. Oh, huh. I call it <laughs> reporting. <laughs> I call it a Frankenstein report. Yeah, that that pulls things in from a variety of places. Because to your point, Joe, I can go over and create a great data set for general analytics and it adds the ad campaigns and so forth. It has no connectivity to what a revenue manager truly needs. Right. I'm, I'm telling them what's going on in marketing, but they got to know what my report says to influence what report they're looking at. It would be so great to have the integration of here's what marketing's saying and here's what revenue management data is saying. And let's put the two together to know what kind of impact we're going to be making choices and changes on. So yeah. all I can say, Lauren, is thank God that the hotel industry is so well organized that API oh. data can be passed dead easy. And this is not going to be, oh, wait, hang on. Like a handshake, not even yeah. a problem. Yeah, hang on, hang on, sorry. <laughs> like a handshake to the face with a fist. I really like what Lily said about taking an entrepreneurial mindset. If you see that... You know, if Ivy tells you or if some other tool tells you there is, a, you know, a particular hole over here or something's working well and something's not, you know, you know, when you can uh, adjust the rate or make a package or, um, you know, put out a press release or uh, use your social media to communicate something that's happening at that time or all of the tricks, you know, I don't think the revenue manager should be, you know, a one hammer, you know, if, if it's, everything's a nail, if, if you've only got a hammer. I was going to say, we're going to quote Tim Peter, you know, every, you have a, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> if, you, if you go to a surgeon, he always wants to cut, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you need to have a full, complete toolkit. And I think that this is a, a great time to explore what you can add to your toolkit. So I think we can summarize by saying no pressure, Javid, here. Um, <laughs> we, we think you might be able to save the industry. So, yeah. you know. But you have until December 2nd. Is that what you said? Or is it longer? <laughs> <laughs> December 2nd. Yeah. I, I even, uh, you know, to, 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 to Tristan's point, I even shamed a vendor in front of a client. Go figure, I was rude. Um, where they're talking about, well, for us to do that, it's going to cost X dollars to do that. And I literally just said, why? Well, because, no, no, no. Why? Do you have to pay somebody to do this? Is there some cost to do? Well, no, we charge. It's like, so you're just basically asking for money to something that you can just, I don't know, flip a switch. Let's be figurative. You know, and they're like, well, no, it requires us. To, don't even try to be <laughs> It's, it requires, you know, the, the thingy to connect with the, the, the other thingy and, and then, yeah, and there's the phalange. And, oh, it's very yeah, oh, yeah, don't forget the watch it. Oh, it. So watch it moves, it has to be calibrated. So, yeah, you yeah. understand. It, it's As it turns there. out, it got integrated into their benefits program for what we were already subscribing. What they call the flux capacitor, though. Yeah. Yes, and don't set the date wrong because then you're really going anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Most of the time is you get you you have to get access to template C versus template A that you're on. Yeah, that's more most and of the work. Forget, you might be on the wrong edition of software. You know, you got to upgrade that plus I buy mean, something more. Guys, do, do, I mean, connectivity fees, the integration fees are the resort fees um, of the <laughs> other side. It's like, hold on, you're telling me I have to pay for something I I should already get. 
Yes, you know. I, you want yeah. my- you tell I mean, me I, I can't connect to them. I have to connect to you, but I got to pay you to do it, even though I'm already paying you to do what you're doing. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I'm resisting hopping onto my soapbox, but I might as well because what a thing that I've been uh, been Go working ahead. been working on, and the reason I haven't been on the uh, the show quite a bit is um, I'm the co-chair of a of a work group with HTNG, and we are developing a unique hotel identifier for every property on the planet, and the code is about ninety percent written. Uh, and we're basically making a registry. If you think of how DNS works with the internet, where you, you know, basically say, "Oh, my website is there because I own it and control it." So go to w, you know, www stuff, whatever. Um, oh, and my mail server is over there. That seems to work out fairly well. Seems that the world can can figure that out. So what we're doing is basically identifying an ID for every property. So the distribution side winds up getting quite simplified in terms of eliminating a lot of cross-reference tables and things like that. But the cool part is, is the backend integration, once you have that, you start using UDDIs and you go, that's my resource. I'm on X version of this API and I'm connected to that data source. And if you can start sharing that with the other organizations you work with, all of a sudden when the API updates or anything like that, it happens automatically. So the industry may change radically when that happens, and that is going to be a massive field leveler. So the ones who are out there saying, oh, no, you've got to pay X to get this. It's like, no, no, we have our data bus. This is our data. We are now going to bolt on your service to this and to get it, you need access to this ID that's going to go get authenticated. Robert, will you still answer our phone calls after you turn rich and famous? I mean, you know, if Ben were to call you up, would you still answer it, or will your secretary or assistant or assistant to the? I show? wouldn't put the How rich. Work? I wouldn't put the rich in front of it because it's a nonprofit. <laughs> so, oh well. Okay. <laughs> um, but, Until uh, someone says. Guys, we could probably charge for this, you know. <laughs> well, oh, no. and, and actually, actually, that um, that has been a very important aspect of this and uh and people who've been around the industry this actually started um 23 years ago and, and the discussion was even longer before probably it's almost as long as it's 30 years to ago count, count the votes in arizona isn't it yeah, yeah yeah exactly but but the big thing is it has to be a non-profit because you can't have google google in 2015 basically said oh yeah we'll run this for you and it's like now nah, you can't I mean, you might be able to do a really good job at it, but the industry won't do it because your business model is incompatible with running a, mm. a neutral industry registry, right? So, um, yeah, so it'll be. Oh, sorry about that. See, Robert, see, you have that effect on I guest co hosts. You just make them disappear. Exactly. I was just ready to ask you a question. It's like, what's his timeline for growth and stuff? But poof. Well, he obviously heard that. So he's like, we've got to retool this to tap into this new stuff. So I got to go. I got to talk to some developers. Robert, I got to say, we haven't had you on the show for a long time. You should open the show. And this is the first time we've lost a guest co-host. <laughs> I do what I do. What can I say? I got to think there's a correlation to this. But while we wait for Javid to come back, if he's going to come back, or maybe he had something. Um, I got to catch up, Stephanie, on a big, big question. What the hell's Marriott doing? Okay. <laughs> I mean, oh, that's seriously, question, isn't it? they first dumped down their whole day pass, hoopy happy pass, and now all of a sudden they get this whole new channel of development marketing. What <laughs> can you and you know details? Because I'm just now getting up to speed with it. No, I'm still trying to keep up to date. They just rolled out a new offers platform that's replacing Brandworks as of two days ago. So I'm scrambling to see what the heck this is about so me too right? i'm like what is all this stuff yeah because i'm I like why can't i get into it and then it's like oh we just pass. pulled a new you know pull a new system out of robot this week so we right. after, after they got rid of all their third-party vendors and all their internal digital marketers and now they left no real revenue for any or, or, or service scale for anybody and all of a sudden they pop a rabbit out of their hat going oh but we got this new platform over here i'm like what? who's been building this <laughs> where'd this come from <laughs> I had yeah, we thought that Robert insulted you, and that's why you left. And we apologize if Robert in any way offended you. Oh, um, that's what I, did. I, I, I I was so deeply offended. I had to hang <laughs> on for a second. That's, that's what I do. Um, it's yeah, it's funny, we were talking about Marriott, though. I had an interview with Adweek yesterday, and the questions the guy was at, asking about day pass and stay pass and everything, like it was ugly. 
it was very because he saw right through everything before both Hilton and, and Marriott, right? Because he's like, well, good. And, you know, he started out, he goes, you know, I was originally writing this thing about how that's going to impact like corporate travel and things like that. But he's like, Hilton, you have to call the hotel to use it. He goes, that's just what's that <laughs> and it's like right what is that it, it's a marketing pitch basically. Can, can, i'd like to flip a question around for javid with what you're doing and what you're producing for reporting and the information that's providing uh i guess mary i brought this to mind for me so many hotels are sitting barren because they built, were built because of corporate travel and now they have no corporate travel and transient is elusive little creature that never chased before or at least never really had to chase that much. They kind of got what they got and that was it. How can what you're providing as information and insight get translated in reverse to action items that are outside revenue management's reporting and marketing's initiatives? How can, how can I take the data that you have and say, ha, huh, I didn't realize that was this and now I need to do this instead. Is there, is there a retranslation of what you're producing and reporting that can help with that angle? So the what we're producing from a reporting standpoint is, you know, where you should be focusing your attention on, right? Because right. because right now if you're running at twenty percent occupancy, you don't really care what's coming through the door, right? But you do want to know what's happening in March, April, May of next year, and if things start going in the right direction, uh, you want your finger on the pulse. You don't want to get to January and then figure out. You know, a particular date in March just kind of got away from you, or a or a long weekend just got away from you in July. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way the way I have been asking GMs to look at this is, you may not see, you know, in a twenty percent market, you know, I, I'll I'll take a seventy nine dollar Expedia. I don't care, right? But if I'm looking at next year April and I have some events on my schedule, I want to know what's happening. I want to keep my finger on the pulse. So that way I don't get to that date and then have to struggle trying to reallocate rooms. Because generally speaking, even pre-pandemic, right, Lauren, unless you had the luxury of time and you had a small enough portfolio, you weren't looking past 90 days. It just, there really wasn't a need for it. Uh, but it's even more critical now that you look past it because I think the, the, the current events, they are what they are, right? You're just going to take what you can. But looking forward is where you're going to see the technology really help you position yourself. Um, I, 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 I guess I should add, I, I'm, a little bit of what I'm doing now for next year is this is what we think. This is what we think is going to happen. This is what we think is going to happen. And here's what we do have to do if it doesn't happen. It's almost like we're creating a parallel of so just what you said, Javid, we have things in April that we think we're going to have business on. But just like down here, all of a sudden they pull the trigger and dump every event that's in December out the door. Done. There is none of these events. There is no New Year's. There is no Christmas. There is no Santa stuff. There's no of the stuff that's normally there. Ben doesn't get to dress up in his cute little outfit with the beard and drink heavily while kids sit on his lap. Something he's going to miss. <laughs> But the idea of it is, is that now all of a sudden, all that business that was wrapped around that and may have already pre-booked, maybe they're in the window of opportunity, they pre-booked because they thought there was opportunity for rate. Now, all of a sudden, what do you do about that? Do you reconnect with the people that book that says, hey, before you cancel, we can do this instead? Or do you look for dropping your rates and making a new campaign push that pushes people that have a lower rate opportunity for it? How does what you're doing help with that? I mean, you're identifying opportunities forward. But how can you, you do? Would you use it kind of what I'm saying? Like say, okay, these are the things, but also make yourself a mirror of what can happen if it doesn't. Um, the technology is not built around that thought process, right? Okay. Uh, what it what it's what it's doing is kind of telling you where to keep your eye on. Uh, I think from a revenue management standpoint, if I take away my technology hat for a minute. You know that is always in the back of your mind as as an as an RM, uh, because you know if something doesn't come to fruition, whether it's during or pre-pandemic, right, the the game plan is always going to be something you need to keep your hand on. Uh, you know, example being you know Chicago just kind of made an announcement yesterday saying nothing in Q1, Q2, no conventions, no nothing happening in 2021. Okay, well that goes the next six months, right? But what Chicago has going for it right now is 
you know there is a lot of drive-in traffic there is there are people are driving from other states generally speaking for a for a staycation i think so if, if you you know if you look at it from that perspective what you thought you were going to get is not coming back you know what else can you do and thinking a little bit outside the box may be the answer but unfortunately the technology is not built around that mm -hmm. yeah. Steph, I know we were having a little conversation in the chat side. Richard Farrar, by the way, one of our guests from times past, is in our tavern with it, who was strong Marriott and so forth. So it kind of connects a little bit to what we're saying, Javid, as to the preemptiveness of what we should be doing and how we're doing. Because as I asked about with Stephanie about the Marriott thing, Richard points out that, you know, they go through the cycle of internalization, externalization, externalization. And Steph, you're completely dead on. It's like, yeah, until they realize, and Dean, you know, how painful it is to try to think you're going to maintain internal capabilities with all the needs for adaptability and change. That said, I mean, you're doing stuff with Marriott now, Javid, that you say you're talking to them in Hilton as to these things. Um, and we know from what Marriott's doing, they're now creating some sort of internal thing to do. And those discussions without being defying any confidentiality, are they ta approaching you with that concept of maybe this is something we want to bring into the integration of what we're trying to do, or are they just still saying you're an external platform that has merit and connectivity? So we are, when I when I talk about Hilton and Maria, we are talking about testing connectivity at the property level. Okay. Uh, we haven't gotten to a scale where we can approach them and say, let's do it from a brand standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 the question is always, will the technology work, right? Because if technology is the barrier, then we need to figure out how to work around it. So that's kind of where we are right now. We're trying to figure out the tech part of it, how to get past the two-factor authentication in order to extract data, or in mm -hmm. order to extract what we need for data. Mm. Um, well, thank you. I mean, is there something that we missed out of asking? I mean, we're not, I mean, is, is there something that we want to make sure that you, or wanted to make sure that you wanted to, to stress or point out or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I think. That means we want to keep the conversation going. I just want to make yeah. sure that we, we're not missing any angle that you wanted to make sure we discussed. I think the other piece that, you know, we've incorporated in our technology is, you know, being, having the ability to tell the user when they're getting bookings, what day of the week, and what time by the hour they are seeing their volume of bookings come through between you know 7 14 21 days out right and you have we can segment it by day of week lead time uh, and, and that gives you the the ability to say you know, if you're a hotel i'm just going to pick new york city for example right it's, it's a new york city hotel you see bookings overnight because it's an international marketplace right you know if people are starting to book your hotel at two in the morning chances are your rm's not sitting by his computer or her by a computer you know, changing rates, right? So you need to be able to plan. So what our technology allows you to do is pre-plan when people are already booking you so you can put your best rates out there. So mm -hmm. we've got that capability and it's very user-friendly uh, from that standpoint. Excellent, excellent. Before we lose track of all this, if people want to find you or know more about the product base itself, where are they, where is it that they can go and how can they reach you? So the website is simply Infinito Solutions infinito.solutions, no calm, no nothing, infinito.solutions. And my email is javid at infinito.solutions. Excellent. Or always my cell phone, <laughs> <laughs> which is always a good, which doesn't seem to stop lately. Yeah, I was about to say, you may not want to give that number out. They can reach you on email and you can talk to them later. Cause gosh knows when you put a phone number on a website, you're getting in the mail. Um, <laughs> Java, we only asked for a half hour and you gave us a full hour. And if you want, by all means, if you want to stay longer, by, by, we would love for you to have your perspective and insights with us. We, we know your time is valuable. We'd, like I said, we'd love for you to hang around uh, if you'd like, or if there's anything else that pops up that you want to discuss, uh, we'd love to have that as well. But uh, we sincerely appreciate you taking the time with us. Adele, thank you for bringing uh, Java to us and on the show for us. Uh, always, ex I mean, truly excellent. I'm going to spend some time and look at all your website stuff and probably call you or reach out to you and ask some more questions anyways. I get a little bit tighter with it. So Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually gonna hang around. I have I kind of canceled my next call so I can kinda of listen Yay! to you. Excellent, because we're gonna go over and save the world and solve crisis problems and because <laughs> whenever we have been in Trist with us, we already have a different a perspective in the world. And then now you had Robert and now you know he's he's that 
that uh, butterfly that creates a hurricane on the other side of the planet. So, because <laughs> I want to get to what Robert, um, I'll send you the link. Actually, I'm going to put the link in for the Bitly, Robert, if you don't mind, for your Rock Cheetah newsletter. That's fine. Because Please you, gave us, yeah. you gave us this topic list, yeah. but that's yeah. almost meaningless compared to the, just, you know, the data you put above it in your, in your notes. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, so I'm, I don't think it's going to cut and paste well in the chat. I'm going to do that. But first, I'm going to put the link in for your news mm. your feed. If you could begin to talk about the highlights you pointed, a.k.a. specifically Choice versus Hyatt, just to say. Um, <laughs> well, and Marriott, too. So. And Marriott, okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to hit that, I want to start dumping some stuff in the chat so that those who are in the chat can see some of this stuff. Because I was starting to look at the numbers the way you were pointing them out, and I'm going, oh, oh, oh. So, yeah, please. Oh, I don't know. I, I just did a little you – know, it's earnings season, right? I mean, aside from everyone in the U.S. being distracted by the election, um, I figured, yeah, let's look at some different types of numbers, which would be um, what's going on with the with the hotel earnings. Um, and I decided to just throw in a couple of OTAs just so people can kind of see you know, some key metrics of what's happening from a uh, – from an overall perspective and and some of the things that came screaming out i mean if you up oh, sorry i accidentally just closed my file here oops um hang on uh, we'll stall for you rob did you guys do like a little monty python thing yeah a little you know, like one of those little animated interludes would be perfect right now so um Ah, hang on, yeah. because as you're saying, the formatting um, is uh, is important here. So, hang on, because I have the non-formatted version. Um, basically, what when you look at this, Choices Revpar um, for the third quarter was higher than Hyatt's. I think was the one that came screaming, oh, screaming out higher than a higher than anything. So, uh, yeah, but you wind up looking at, you know, occupancy percentages. Um, it winds up being rather, you know, rather stunning because, you know, you're saying, wow, look at these guys are down in the, you know, thirties, forties, yeah, choice is over 50%, which is, which is fantastic. And everybody's looking at that. But I mean, when you're really looking at RevPAR, that's, that's an eye opener when you don't necessarily, you look at those profiles of those, those brand portfolios, you are not expecting choice to come out with a higher rev bar than a, yeah, than a, than certainly a Hyatt and mm -hmm. only $2, you know, basically $2 below Marriott, which yeah. is, is just crazy. Oh, cool. And that's, that's the world we're, we're living in. And, you know, and, and they're down, you know, 30%, 28.8%, but you look at Hyatt, they're down 72%. Rev par wise, Marriott's down, you know, sixty six percent, pretty much. You see that? I'm, I'm putting them up what you're talking about since it's, yeah. it's yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's um, yeah, there are just some really interesting numbers. But um, what I the other one that I kind of pulled out, which unfortunately I didn't have it for Marriott, um, was capex, and you can see, you know, Hyatt and and Hilton have now squeezed their capex down. Um, yeah, the 13 million, 16 million for the quarter, which are down 83%, 76%. So they aren't putting a bunch of money into developing technologies or, or whatever. It's, you know, the, the hatches are batting, are batting down. Whereas Choice is actually only down, you know, only down a third. They're spending, you know, more than twice as much, uh, twice as much as high it is on, uh, on CapEx, which is, which is pretty amazing. So, They're but then. Hilton and Hyatt together. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so it's a uh, it's pretty. Amazing. And unfortunately, I didn't have it for Marriott because they they posted their earnings this morning, and um, I couldn't get into their uh, their SEC filing hadn't been posted yet. So, um, but but then you look at what's going on with Booking Expedia. Oh, their capex is two hundred and twenty two million, one hundred and forty five million, things like that. And and Expedia is spending more. On, on their headquarters, that's excluding the headquarters. And they're down maybe 20% sort of thing. So look what's happening, folks. It's going to be, uh, it's going to get, it's going to get interesting because they're, you know, at least those large brands um, who are largely marketing organizations that are trying to channel revenue into, into hotels, very similar to the business models of the, uh, not necessarily the business models, but the same, uh, need that the uh, the brands need to generate 
it's it's going to get interesting that when you you cut off all these things and you've gotten down the hatches and the other guys are out there still you know still churning away on building their core systems um watch out so when i ask myself the question what did choice do that everybody else did and the first thing that comes to mind is they're the one brand that had a massive tv campaign last summer uh and i'm, I'm curious if that is something that led into q3 and, and, and helped that helped reduce the loss year over year in Q3? I think a lot of it was just structural, right? It's just the profile, the hotels. I mean, the folks at the top, they're still large, you know, and poor Hyatt, right? I mean, you've got these massive, you know, 800 room convention hotels and things like that. Yes. They're you know, so heavily reliant on on group. That's just gone where choice is out there. I, I think um, the CEO mentioned that, I can't remember what percent of their, their properties are within a mile of a, of a major highway interchange you know, yeah. sort of thing. Um, that's it. It's just like a structural, you know, a structural thing. So, um, you don't have uh, windows yet by chance. I didn't No. Um, I'd be curious to see theirs mixed in there too. Yeah, they probably did. I, there was only so much yeah. I could kind of fit, but <laughs> Robert, come on, you slacking. There's a back, a back of the envelope thing, right? So, uh, <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I, I threw it together in an hour or two. So. We're counting on you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing was the pipeline, though, which I just find comical at this point where you look at, oh, well, it looks like, yeah, Cho Choice is going to be adding, you know, another 900 or almost 1,000 properties. Um, it looks like uh, Hilton's going to add 2,600. Hyatt's going to add another 500. And Merritt's going to add another, almost 3,000. And you're wow. like, Really? Hmm. Okay. So I think your pipeline may be a little leaky. Richard's pointing out that uh, oh, sorry. conversions or is it only new builds? That's everything. That's everything in the pipeline. Conversions, new builds, the whole that they have contracts mm -hmm. that maybe it's not in the ground. Maybe it's in construction. Maybe it's suspended. Cons who knows? Right. That's. Mm -hmm. Richard points out about the segmentation, you're rolling the brands together. And if you pull out certain brands, they'd probably be a little bit more contrasting to what Choice is doing, like uh, Courtyard and uh, Fairfield Inn and stuff like that. And all of that is broken out on Marriott's reports. And please yeah. feel free to do that analysis. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but it goes so to, across it, 30, Marriott's 30 brands. So. It, it, it does go to an earlier conversation we had with another guest co host, uh, Tracy where they were talking about uh, their teams developing what would be new hotels. And maybe there's a rethink into maybe channeling that to ownerships related to current hotels reinventing themselves. I mean, how, how, how much can a, a comp an ownership group lean into a brand to break contract? I don't know. Stafford, you, I mean, if, if the brand is falling down in its ability to, to contribute and produce that brand value isn't there. Is there a legal, opportunity for oh. an ownership to go guys you're i'm paying for nothing i'm on out i want to do my own thing i've had the marriott I've, ha I've had marriott kick a hotel out of the brand but i haven't had an owner ever get out of a franchise contract no matter oh. how well much. service properties um trust the reit um has pulled what 200 yeah. hotels out of, between ihg and marriott because and they marriott. were they were missing their their payments the you know both groups went delinquent tried to rework it saying hey the world has changed and yeah we can't really give you what we committed but you understand and the reit said we don't understand we got this piece of paper <laughs> and oh by the way we own a third of uh, Sinesta. <laughs> so how convenient and they've moved them over Sinesta's tripled their triple their size. So the question on a lot of it is, yeah, do you want to get involved in a big, you know, a big fight with a with Marriott's legal department and, and that's or Hilton or whoever, right? Not to pick up Marriott. Um, yeah, that's not necessarily so good, but only that situation is if they owe you money, right? If you owe them money, it's you're in, right? Yeah. You've got to stick with it. You sign the deal and yeah, they, you might get some relief in terms of negotiating some terms. They're certainly softening on um, oh, PIP programs and uh, and standards are just going out the window, right? It's all that stuff is softening like crazy. A couple, couple, couple things. First off, Steph, you're sharing a, a very famous or currently famous uh, argument that's going on. Um, 
uh, in Phuket as to what Marriott and, and ownership is trying to do over there. Yeah. And then Richard keeps pointing out about relationship repairs and loans might follow for it. But uh, yeah, that it, you are talking about the fact that brand is not being what brand was before because they're no longer hotel hoteliers. They're their franchise right. their marketing arm, as you said. Yeah. They own a handful of, you know, I don't think any of the major brands owns more than uh, you know, 30 or 40 hotels, maybe a, maybe a hundred in a couple of cases, but very, very minimal. Um, and even Marriott, I think they manage 2,600 of their, you know, 70, you know, 500 hotels or something like that. So, yeah. They don't get too lax on the brand. Like I have, I have a love hate with like QA and brand restrictions because you want them yeah. you know, to, to make sure that you keep up your standards, but you know, you have to, you can't maintain everything, but you know, Hilton started to do their QAs virtually. And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> two ways. And I'm like, we're going to do these virtually? How, what? Really? Uh, How's this going to go down? That's going to work really well. Yes, yeah. this is the new room with the new furniture. Now yeah. let's walk over to the new room with the furniture. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and and they don't, they're big, they're big problem. And this happens. It doesn't matter if it was 2001 or 2009. They're walking that tightrope because they don't want to be too harsh where they go, if you don't do this, you're out of the agreement. And the owners go, Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh no, no, really? No. What? I, I, I can't keep my agreement. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. What a shame. But yeah. I hope they learned the lesson that I, she did not learn until it was too late. Laxing too much on uh, brand requirements and Absolutely. maintaining creates a lot of brand dilution that turns into why do I want to stay at a what hotel? It doesn't, it's not the same. Just because the sign's the same, the product isn't. Well, you let it go too much. I Val, Val, and Perini, you, yeah, Val and Perini and I were sending emails back and forth um, this morning. And she said, classic example was she took a trip, you know, down, you know, had a nice long drive from Massachusetts to somewhere in the Southeast. And she said, yeah, on the way down, stayed at a hotel. It was spectacular. Same brand. I won't mention it. I won't shame them. I normally do, but what the heck. Yeah, um, but, nice for they, <laughs> but but went down. Actually, I don't remember which one. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so, um, but she went down, stayed at a hotel. You know, great, spectacularly clean. Everything's perfect. Came back, different property, right? Just horrible, right? I mean, just the worst. And she's like, "This is going to be, this is going to get grim, right?" Yeah. So Richard, which is well, also that was a again. problem pre-pandemic. I mean, I think there's still yeah, massive that's inconsistency. True. I don't think that was necessarily calls, but I think the bigger problem is the hotels whose value proposition within that brand was food and beverage, whether it's embassy suites with their, you know, or whatnot that have the higher F and B. Now it's all, it's much more of a flat. So if you couldn't make a differentiation case before you, it's even harder now. Well, the, hard, the, the hotels that had the hardest time were the ones that were in a known location that they didn't have any other brand representation. So the brand took a bit of a blind eye as to their maintenance standards because they really wanted to make sure they had a product in that market and they didn't have other product at the time. Where they really start getting tight and demanding constant upgrades is when they have brand dilution and saturation in a market and they can just push everybody around going, hey, if you're not on the latest greatest, you know, you're, everybody else that has the same flag or same similar flag for sister properties are gonna get your business because you're, you're not keeping the band stand, band stand. And, uh, you know, but if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're the only product out there, they tend to be like, yeah, sure. It's okay to have a cow walk through the hallway. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that was Could the situation happen. with the, with the service, you know, the SPT properties. Um, you know, once they start going delinquent, that wasn't like an oversight. They looked at that. They knew the calculations. They're going, yeah, we're going to lose a hundred properties. A lot of them were good long-term stay properties, things like that. But they're making the calculation. Do we give them $11 million of cash that we owe them? Or do we lose the hundred properties? Right. And well, it's triage. It's it. right now. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Brands and everybody else is in triage right now. What, who lives, who doesn't? And what do we keep and what do we don't? I mean, New York is, is I mean, Javi, you probably talked to this more directly or, or, or Adele, really. You know, there, there's vultures out there right now that are picking up properties for a song simply by taking on a percentage of the debt and allowing the hotel to exist. The bank just wants somebody to make sure the keys are in the front door to keep it open. They don't, they're, they're letting, the, you know, uh, who was it? Ashford lost some. Um, there's well, a few properties that got... And the money is still all on the sidelines. Nothing has happened right. yet. Just wait 
It's the when things get bad. Yeah, let's go through the first. Let's finish off the first quarter and see how things you know are going. Then um, there are a bunch of folks on the sidelines with you know spacks and things like that that are going to come in and just be bottom feeding like crazy. The interesting thing is there's so much money on the sidelines though. Is that going to have bidding wars to get these prices up? I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting how all this works out. I think there's going to be so much inventory on market. I think it's still, I don't think it's going to, yeah. I mean, if somebody walks over and starts competing too high, they're going to be like, yeah, go ahead. You take it. I'll go oh, over yeah. And get yeah. Everybody will have, they'll have their number. Right. And yeah. But, uh, yeah, but who just, knows? It should be interesting. Um, well, oh, yeah. Nice and happy there. Good. Let's pick something better to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, since you gave us a wonderfully curated list and less Ben and Tris came with something from across the pond that was, show and tell that they want to talk about the happiness of living in a wonder in, in lockdown again. Oh. We, can, we can count quicker. Uh, oh, oh, from, oh. From, from New Guinea. What? From New Guinea. Hello. <laughs> G'day. G'day, sport. Uh, the only reason that the election's quicker in England than the U.S. is it's a lot smaller, my friend. Uh, okay. And, okay. So. Hang on. Hang on a second. I'm defending the U.S. Yeah. I'm going to what's going on here. Come on. You should hand your passport in, Butler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> yeah, you can you can imagine how the, the how the reporting over here. Um it's like a it's like a reality TV show that you sort of wish wasn't reality. Mm -hmm. Um oh, yeah. getting you know minute by minute updates on it. Yeah, all too true. Uh, all too true. <laughs> but it'll be our turn in a thousand days and you can laugh at us instead. Well, I mean, just from a pragmatic point of view, between now and the end of the year, regardless of anything that happens in the next couple of days or today even, uh, we're dealing with a very interesting holiday period because you have this mixed messaging that's going on. Uh, Black Friday doesn't exist per se in a retail perspective. Cyber Monday doesn't exist per se in a, in a historical value that it used to because everybody's loading, front-loading all of their offers and opportunities from a sales perspective. Hotels following the, the, the pattern of retail are already in market with what they're thinking is what rates that they're trying to pitch for people to do whatever they're going to do for the holiday season. Um, but then again, what is the holiday season? Are you really going to go to grandma's house for Thanksgiving in the U.S.? Are you really going to go over and get together with family and Christmas? If you're in you guys' cases, you can't even have that as a choice. You can't go travel somewhere, period, done, can't do it. And so, well, you know, what happens then and goes back to Jeff, what we said before, how does that get calculated in to say, I got a hotel, I got rooms, who's still able to get in a car and go somewhere or ride the train or whatever uh, through the period of time? I mean, Myrtle I Beach is just going to do whatever they do because they don't wear masks anyway. But, you know, just, yeah. that's not true. That's <laughs> like, very, very masked here. I will say in general, though, I mean, if you look at Labor Day weekend as an example, Americans are willing to travel. There is not an apprehension that there was maybe two or three months ago. I think anecdotally, everyone I know is doing maybe a slightly revised version of Thanksgiving, but they're getting together with family. Like I don't think people aren't going to travel, aren't going to go see family for Thanksgiving. I think that's going to happen, but probably slightly modified, slightly safer in some cases. But... A lot of people forgot there's a pandemic going on, so we'll see. Well, yeah, another, another, another thing there also, at least you know, in, in, in our part of town, in the Chicago area, and if the weather holds true, you can still have a, a decent family gathering outdoors mm -hmm. and, and have that event, right? Mm -hmm. Again, it, it, it may not be the traditional, you know, 50 people under, your, under the same roof type of deal, but you can still gather relatively safely. Um, yeah, I agree. And I think it'll be in small parts. Like if I look anecdotally again at, at a sample size of one, my family or my wife's family, typically we would get together with multiple combined families. There'd be like a hundred people at a church hall and they'd all get together. This year, each of the smaller families are getting together on their own. Right? They're not doing one massive event, they're doing five or ten smaller events. So, so Stuart, how do, much, how, how do you know so much about traveler sentiment and interest? I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've asked a few questions. I think last tally, we we, uh, we were over 60,000 total survey responses over a 30-week period. So it's probably the most com comprehensive longitudinal travel study that exists out there. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any larger. So, yeah, we've, we've learned a thing or two. Majority of people have traveled. 
The majority of people want to continue to travel. The majority of people are scared, but you can mitigate the risk and eliminate the fear. So, yeah, I, I think travel is looking good in general. It's, I mean, obviously it has challenges. It's not ideal, but mm. I think considering where we have been, I think we've, we've got a lot of positivity in front of us. Absolutely. Right. Everybody's just got fear fatigue. Yeah. Everyone's just worn out of being scared. And the longer something goes on for, the less people start to give a toss about it. Mm-hmm. So right. I think we're seeing a lot of that. something that, that erodes over time, right? You, you, you don't, it doesn't tend to ex- exacerbate itself. It doesn't tend to get worse. It tends to diminish over time. And well, especially this, as you like dip your toe in and do things. This mm-hmm. lockdown is exactly the same. It is nowhere, nowhere near as um, uh, impactful as the, as the first lockdown. Um, they're, they're actually the conditions that they put on it over here in the UK are not the same as well. So apparently, um, I was speaking to, to somebody who was saying that you can still hold a business meeting of up to thirty people during lockdown right now because business is still allowed to continue. It's obviously got to be socially distanced, but it's still in, indoors. And I'm like, well, you know, the schools are still open, whereas previously they weren't. I can see a big no, no it's a change. Sorry, Ben. I, I don't mm. know if you guys saw the notice. There was a sorry, Dean. There was a chap over here. Um, the lockdown rules came in, and he said, "Look, you you can't have your family around to your house. Nobody's allowed to come to your house. You can't meet anybody indoors. But you can have business meetings." So this one guy registered a company in his own name uh, and employed his family on zero hours contracts. <laughs> <laughs> and, said, started then, isn't it? and said on Christmas <laughs> Day, we're having a business meeting at my house. Board meeting. <laughs> Yes. Hey, so how was your cousin? Your cousin? Earlier? <laughs> your cousin? <laughs> that means that the turkey's tax deductible. That's great. You can write it up. <laughs> always thinking, Stuart. Always thinking. Genius. <laughs> Absolute genius. Yeah. Well, now, I have another potential question that I don't know if it's getting asked by anybody in, in general mainstream is how many people are not going to take advantage of holiday uh, time or can't because they're like we sent earlier on, revenue managers are doing way more than sitting behind a desk calculating things. They're behind a front desk, they're turning tables. Who knows what else everybody's doing, you know, to to, to justify their weekly paycheck. Um, I think it depends you know, on the industry, to be honest, Lauren. Um, yeah. if, you've, if you've been on furlough for the last seven months, the last thing you want is to take three weeks off over Christmas to spend it with your family. Um, I, yeah. I think some people are probably Nobody rather... Nobody takes three weeks, Ben. Nobody. <laughs> sorry, sorry. You're right. If you want to take 30 seconds of grovel for some time like, off. They crazy vacation time. Uh, <laughs> All yeah. the same, same. Yes, I think the impact's going to be the same because for those who have a job they're, and thankful to have it, they're least likely to say, hey, I want to take off any chunk of time because... That might put them in jeopardy of, long, you know, their, their boss saying, well, if you're willing, you know, I need you here. And if you're not going to, I'll pick up another person that's standing outside the door waiting to get a job. Um, I think to that, to, to some degree. But yeah, I'm sorry, D, yeah, go ahead. When we start look at every industry, you look at all the people that are still working remotely, there'll be a lot more people able to travel for a longer period over the holidays and stay at their parents' house or somewhere else while they're working remotely. Uh, Another thing that starts to happen too that I that I learned earlier this week actually I was talking with a gentleman that's with our our city's economic development board and he was talking about how of course hotel revenue hotel taxes and luxury taxes are all down significantly to be expected but I'm in a small town I refer to myself as being in Omaha Nebraska because nobody knows where Norfolk Nebraska is okay but it's a, a little town up in northeast Nebraska. And one of the things that has happened is that although our sales, t- our, our, our revenue from the hotel industry is down, as you would expect, the city taxes that they're getting off of sales tax are up exponentially. And the reason being that people are doing all this online shopping. Well, we're in a community that doesn't have a Best Buy, that doesn't have a uh, uh, Shields or you know any of these big box stores, right? Now, all of a sudden, guess what? We're getting sales tax revenue from Best Buy. Because people are buying this stuff. And so that has been actually helping our community significantly. Stuart, you're like the guy off of the life of Brian. Look to the bright side of life. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a t that I said that. On. That was kind of my mantra for a while. Yeah. But it's true, yes. To the point that if you don't have a job to worry about necessarily over holidays, you can actually travel more. Robert, you're waving your hand. Why are you waving your hand? I can't hear you. It's because he's doing mine mine yes 
Yeah. Uh, you know what? It, it's been a while since he's been on the show. I think back at the time, it, it was there weren't talkies, right? With oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you <laughs> have to He's about to oh. hold up a sign with the words narrating what the yes. <laughs> he's right he's holding up. Six, he just sticks the knife in. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think Charlie Chapman was on the last show that, that, that the Robert was Robert, try it again. Nope. Nope. First word. Sounds yeah. like. <laughs> uh, nope, nope, good job we can't nope. lip read you probably haven't used that microphone <laughs> headset for a year it's probably I, broken i think i don't get it's okay is, is this the guy that's doing connectivity for the whole industry <laughs> yeah, let's not bring that up <laughs> <laughs> i i want to lay the foundation yeah. for a lot of the, the the connectivity of the whole industry that's, that's Barely true. Some of the companies he worked for were integral to the GDS yeah. and stuff. He's, he's yeah. their technological advisor. <laughs> Robert, if you can hear us, I wanted to ask you before you go anywhere, what is property number one? Type it in the chat menu. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just brutal. So, uh, I think, Robert, he's brutal. asking what's the first property that's going to be integrated. Yeah. Oh, um, says Robert. Well, give me a second, guys. I'm just going to... It's going to be a big algorithm. There won't be a one, will there? There won't no, be. No, no. But, you know, I actually... Going to going to something that Robert did point out while he figures out what's going on tech is you look at what's shifting in Vegas. It's just headlines in the sense that it's like they're announcing, hey, by the way, they're thinking about selling the Venetian or MGM's doing this. That's some big moving and shaking going on. Those are no small things mm -hmm. yeah. for that kind of migration of not just inventory and assets, but just whole shifting of who has control because it really is control of an ecosystem as to who's going to be calling the shots and that kind of play. Because we know that Orlando runs that way to a certain degree, but Vegas is its own world. I mean, they 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 don't run by everybody else's rules. They don't do the same reporting everybody else has done because. But they're reporting they don't compare themselves to anybody. Only recently have been some Asian markets that are comparable to what uh, Las, Las Vegas does. But nothing that, that you know, the, the, if they change the changing of the guard, the way they're looking at it, that's going to fundamentally change how business is being done in Vegas. Well, I mean, there's there's lots of lots of big news of, of changes and, and shaking and, and things that we were talking about there. I mean, you know, Vegas aside, there was a uh, an article came out yesterday that um, the, the the much anticipated um, Airbnb IPO it mm. looks like it's finally going to happen. So it looks like they've, they've got it on reliable sources. They're going to file next week, which means that they will go um, and they will they will they'll set to 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 kick their IPO off at the end of this, uh, December. It will make them the biggest IPO of twenty twenty. Um, mm. it, it all goes to plan. So they. They've got a likely valuation of about thirty billion dollars, and they're looking to raise around three billion from the uh, uh, from the, the capital raise, which is just monstrous when you think about it. And I mean, I, you know, I know Stuart loves talking about this, but this is from a business perspective of it. You know, there's an article floating out with Max these days where he's asking for, "Do you think the IPO? How is the IPO going to affect hospitality?" And at first, I was thinking like, "Why would it?" But then again, I also retracted that thought by thinking whenever you go public now the whole focus of the company has changed yeah you know and now it's about what are you going to be doing to be competitive to you know basically provide value to to your stockholders at that point we saw we saw every company once they went public change facebook Google, all that so I, does it make it more aggressive from a marketing perspective does it make it more uh uh, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it has a massive impact on the business because they're going to now be beholden to different stakeholders who really are demanding ex excessive growth, right? Wall Street doesn't really worry about profitability as much anymore as it does expansion. Like that That's how stock prices seem to be valued right now. So they're going to have to diversify their portfolio. They're going to have to find new revenue streams. But I do think on the flip side, it's, it's pretty smart for them. Like I, I've never, I always whine about when we talk about Airbnb on the show, but it's not anything against Airbnb. I, I admire what they've done. They've pivoted so many times and been really successful. But I think there's, there's still a, a swath of consumer out there that still sees it as a, I don't think I want to try that. That's not for me, right? Because it's, it's, there's still this, I'm dealing with some 
faceless organization and I'm dealing with a, a regular person. I'm renting from directly from a person. I wonder what psychological impact this has from a, from a promotion and marketing perspective when they're now a big public company. It could be similar to Uber. Uber saw a big jump in participation when they went public. And I'm wondering if we're going to see the same thing here with Airbnb, where some consumers now say, oh, this is a more legitimate proposition and I'm going to try it. And I've never tried it before. So it'll be interesting to see. I think they've already been fairly aggressive because if you look at the sheer volume of um, venture capital that they've had injected into them, I mean, that, that type of money doesn't come without huge amounts of pressure. I don't think the average consumer sees that, right? We see it because we're in the industry. But when they go public, I think it's a, it's a game changer from a consumer perspective because the mainstream media will be talking about it. Mainstream media, you know, the CNN hasn't really been talking about people putting venture capital into Airbnb. They no. will be talking about the, it going um, public. And so it, it changes where it sits in the zeitgeist. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But I still, I still think with the sheer volume of money that they've had, they, 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 they have been aggressive in their marketing strategies. Whether that's, like you say, maybe not quite getting in the mainstream media, but they're still, yeah. you know, I mean, if I look at here, um, series, series F in March 2017 was 448 million. And in September 2006, it was 555 million. And it just goes down. June 2015, yeah. 1.5 billion. Uh, the amount of money yeah. that they've had pumped into them has not been small. <laughs> Let's put no, it that way. I mean, they're massive. But I think once they start getting exposure on the Today Show and, and mm. Good Morning America and sh stuff like that, that hits, you know, the soccer moms and, and just the average consumer that isn't in travel, I, I think it changes the, the perception completely. And, and it's not just the US as well, because Airbnb is... Is, is global you know obviously it's it's over here in europe and it, it, if they it, you know if they're managing to get as much traction i think what makes them a little bit more worrisome not worrisome i think worrisome from the hotel point of view but uh, but also interesting from an investor point of view is that it might actually um yeah see you later ben like um it, it might actually um get them more people signing up to actually you know because it, it started out that you could rent your room out that was the idea mm -hmm. Let's get, it was a platform to actually get some money for your spare bedroom and who knows other people might actually see this as a uh, as a business venture something that they can actually go and get into which previously may not have thought about it yeah and that that becomes again more dangerous for the the, the hotel world well one, one aspect I don't know if you guys can hear me now can you hey me now? robert let's yeah, pretend no. we can't hear I know that's <laughs> hey that new feature they have on this platform on live webinar where you can remotely mute Lauren works really effectively. So. <laughs> we, it, we, we call it the editing on button. We we had yeah, to exactly. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the uh, oh one thing though is if you look at the the net promoter score though for Airbnb, it's uh it's pretty strong. I mean this is last year. I don't know what it is in you know, now in, in 2020, but in 2019, it was a 74. I mean, Starbucks is 77. Netflix is 68. Amazon, 62. I mean, that, now Tesla is 96, which is Tesla is just crazy, right? They have but, a small group of fanatical consumers. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, much smaller. But for Airbnb, it's 74 to be kind of in the Starbucks, above Netflix, above Amazon. That's going to be, yeah that will put some wind in your sails. So yeah, I think the IPO will get a lot of attention and it, it kind of legitimizes it, right? Because before it was kind of like, well, here's something you can stay on people have, but now all of a sudden it's it's in a stock market and it looks you know, more yeah, real. Right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, there's, yeah. I mean, there's also some other factors that play that not necessarily direct towards Airbnb, but you know, California, because of all of what's going on, hasn't really pointed out the fact that they legitimized Uber uh, not oh, having yeah. to pay their employees. Oof, as employees. That's, that's that was really really interesting. Yeah, yeah. That that's going to have a really big ripple into this 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 economy of I don't have to actually pay people for the work. I mean, Florida endorsed the minimum wage going up and what have you, which is just token effort towards a problem that's not being solved by it. But the at least it's a positive direction. But that not saying that Uber drivers are employees that need to be paid or uh, given opportunities as employees 
is is a, a pretty strong legitimizer for other entities within that uh, consumer economy to have. You know, I don't have to pay you. I'm just oh, going to make you stuff. I, let me. It's going to overflow to everything. Uh, hotels mm -hmm. will be embracing that aggressively. Yeah, it gives Absolutely. Business, uh, permission to exploit employees. Yeah. Absolutely, which is not yeah. good yeah. in the long no. run. Yeah, I, they I, really. I, the answer, though, was actually to go to three different things because you have a W-2 employee, right? You got a 1099 employee, and you really needed something kind of between those for contract. Because, again, the platform sets the pricing and dictates everything, right? It isn't an independent contractor who goes, well, I want to take this. Yes, you can take the, the trip or not, but you can't vary the price of your trip, right? It's not the same not the same thing at all. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You've heard the last of that, and I and think that's complex true. to do. So that's not mm -hmm. going to happen anymore, right? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. So everything's going to shift to ten ninety nine. It's like health insurance. No, we don't need to add thirty percent to our, yeah. you know, to our cost structure. Yeah, you know, fend for yourself, sort of thing. Yeah. So, did did anyone else find that article interesting? When they they made a comment about you know what what Airbnb has been doing during the, the pandemic and and. They said they're going to be rolling out requirements like sanitization requirements on November twentieth. I'm like, that's. I thought they 40. already have. No, well, no, they've they, done they, some, they, right? But they're doing stricter ones November twentieth. I'm like, that's forty weeks after the pandemic really started in North America. It seems like it's a, a little bit, you know, yeah. the, the horse is bolted and you're closing the barn door a little bit. I think they were relying on the reviews and the the host at least on the platform could say, here are our cleaning protocols mm -hmm. and laid out. So you could kind of go, Oh, here's what they're doing. Now, are they actually doing it or not? I don't know, but you could, you could wind up, you know, hammering them with negative reviews, but mm -hmm. I think they were relying on that. I think it's IPO related, right? Again, it's just like, Probably, here's yeah. A strict, yeah. You know, they're growing up and they're like, okay, yeah, you know what? This is going to make sense to put that in. We don't want something to be someone gets sick or Airbnbs or, you know, hives for COVID or something. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that was why I put that top article as the, uh, or no, I know, I couldn't really hear because I was off for a while. Did you guys, that's why I put the top article as it's safe to stay, stay in a hotel. That was from the Associated Press, right? And yeah. they kind of said, yeah, go to short-term rentals. Hotels are, yeah, dangerous, which is yeah, not, I, I wish, not good. I wish the big <laughs> lobbying groups were doing more, and especially the ones that have budget for PR, you know, AHLA and AHOA and folks like that. I, I, I wish we'd been ahead of this before, saying <laughs> the hotels are safe, the travel is safe, responsible travel is fine. Because even even that article was was kind of one side. It was like, oh, it's it's better to stay in a in a beach house or a vacation rental. But yeah. then in a little little bit at the bottom, it was like, but there's no evidence that you're a high risk in a hotel. Right? Like, there right. isn't any evidence that people are contracting in hotels. And you know, Laura, what yeah. we're shouting from the rooftops. Lauren, Which, I wish we had done a room. webinar with those guys like in March. Mm -hmm. You know, with the, mm -hmm. the heads of those associations and when we warned them that this is going to be serious. And they're like, no, this is just going to pass. It's going to go pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wish, wish. Yeah. Wish yeah. that could have well, happened. We, we, we also have the responsibility <laughs> to promote the fact that travel is safe. The responsible travel is safe. We all need to be Absolutely. safe. That's yeah. the, and I think that's the point we made in March was if mm -hmm. people don't feel safe traveling, they won't travel. And you have to fix that first. At the, yeah. It's the, a perception. Of Revpar the, is an outcome. Mm -hmm. It's an outcome. It's not an input. <laughs> Yeah. Sort of mm -hmm. thing. You've got to get the, you've got to get the public safety thing done. No, did your microphone work yet? No, no. I still got no audio. Well, I do. I do want to point out one thing to it, and I, and I'm not trying to bash associations at this point, but by inherent nature, the associations follow whoever's treating them nicely, and mm -hmm. I feel like Alhoa and and uh, HLA have kind of landed on the wrong foot. Uh, because they were trying to, you know, by by getting what they wanted at the short term, they were endorsing or sharing or collaborating or supporting aspects of the people that they have that they get the monies from. And then when that dried up, they really didn't push for really keeping core of the industry. They were just looking for their next best friend, and That's they right. didn't find a new next best friend. And and we unfortunately haven't really helped our industry per se because they didn't take the banner to the point that we said earlier and said things like we're talking about right now, it is safe if you make it safe. It can be what you need it to be if you take the precautions you need to take to make you feel like it's a safe 
environment. You can't just wag a finger and say, Hilton says we're doing Lysol stuff now. Every Hilton's safe. It's not. Brand doesn't follow through consistently. And, and, and you know, now air, airplanes are trying to show off. We have multi-filtration. Here's all these studies we're doing to show you that when somebody sneezes in aisle 12, it doesn't hit aisle one and so forth. And so they're trying to prove all this stuff where at the end of the day, it's, it's about if you're wanting to travel, you can travel. You can do it safely, but by the same token, what safe means to you is entirely different what safe means to me. And from a medical perspective, some people just don't have that option. They really can't put themselves into that that troublesome way because it puts too much risk, regardless of their safety sure. protocol. Right? It, yeah. it comes down to individual decision making, but we all take risks every day in every decision we make. And, and I think we, we as an industry have not done a good enough job painting a picture that is pro travel, right? I think we've allowed other narratives to take hold. We let, let the mainstream media, especially right before 4th of July, would call in places, cesspools of COVID and really focusing on locations being these, these disgusting areas where everyone's catching COVID. And when you really drilled down and looked at it, it was, it was irresponsible behavior from a few individuals that was creating problems. And we really haven't rectified that narrative. We haven't gone back and said, here are the actual numbers. Here's how many people have actually contracted COVID on a plane. Here's, and they weren't wearing a mask, you know, and here's, if you wear a mask, what the statistics are. Here's how, what your risk factors are in a hotel. But instead we get fluff pieces like this one, where it's like uh, some expert who is an expert on, on diseases says, oh, hotels should probably do a 72 hour gap between states. Right. Like, well, yeah, and you sure. don't need and you so don't need 72 hours because the everything that I've read, the, the disease does not exist well on these surfaces, right? Sure. So, but yeah. but you but you could argue that yeah, if somebody's checking out at 2 p.m. and coming in at 4 p.m., uh, yeah, maybe that's not so great, and maybe you should clean the room properly, which should have been happening before the pandemic anyway. I but, wouldn't even <laughs> Robert, I'd been contested that we're we're not we're looking at one thing compared to all things. Oh and yeah, go back to the old economic classes. If you could make everything else constant, you could look at this one variable, and that's never true. Oh no, there's airborne versus surface. Remember the guy that we used right. to giggle about when he, we said poop, and we all laughed. I was you just know, about to say we're getting close to biofilm, biofilm aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Right, we're getting close to biofilm. Yeah. But the idea of it is that there's more components to this process other than just us selecting oh. surface contact conversions and yeah. airborne's and so forth. It is a it is a being informed well enough to not politicize the wearing of protection versus non wearing protection. What right. we do, whether it's two hours gap between the room, I honestly would feel that if you went over and told me you threw open the windows and blew out air in the room, fifteen minutes before after somebody left it, I'd be okay. Oh, it's but, just having you know, those, it's having those processes which are saying here's what we do. Right. right, and these are the standards, and we abide by them. And by God, we are focused on it because our job is to protect you, protect our employees, make sure it's great. Those are table stakes, right? But that's not what's getting. That's not what's getting communicated. You're getting no. the major well, hotel brands. There's a little. There's a little banner, and it says, "Click on this about our COVID stuff," and it links you off literally. And I'll pick on Marriott because they haven't changed this and. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. You're trying to look for a hotel in Key West. You click on that and you go to the governor of Florida's website, which right. it's a it's not even a landing page having anything to do with with COVID. It's insane. Yeah, or you get publicity stunts where they partner with Lysol because there's a brand associated with cleanliness. Right. Yeah. Right. But so yeah, what does that do to protect? But you've got to look at that. You've got to look at this in context as well. COVID has come along, and the information that we're talking about is with the the clarity of you know twenty twenty hindsight that we've got at the moment. We can you can see everything that's happened in the past. Yeah. During the time, it was it was changing that much. You know, first it was you, you can you're gonna you can catch it by touch and things. Well, actually, no, you can. And but it took took a while for this to come out. Or if you, if you can catch it by touching, it's very unlikely or whatever. And you'd still have people arguing that red was blue and blue was green and God knows what else. When you've got organizations the size of Marriott, they cannot, they cannot change their policies quick enough. They, they, right. It's just not. But it's the same that right. we do with Airbnb. This is a perfect storm for them where they're, they're just geared up for failure from the get-go. Yeah. 
Because they could, pressures, they're devastated because they laid so many people off. Well, yeah, then I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, you factor that in. If that, you know, it's it, there's not a cat in hell's chance that the hospitality industry was ever going to succeed at this. If we were looking to the big boys, who are the only ones who've got the political clout to be able to go out to like CNN and and, and challenge right. some of them. That's why we have these these you know, organizations that are supposed to support lobbying and things like that. You know, that's why they exist is, is to be a voice for the small guy. And I just haven't felt. But, but, but so, that wasn't their messaging. Their messaging was give us money, de-risk our industry, right? Yeah. Look at, you know, you're de-risking the airline industry, de-risk our industry, right? Yeah. So, Which is important yeah. and necessary, for yeah. sure, right? Yeah. But we could have, but that was, that was done in the first four weeks, you know? Yeah. What's, what's happened in the last, 30 weeks. Self-preservation. Well, yeah, but it's sort of earlier chat. Well, and a lot of a lot of these associations are not necessarily H and L A. H and L A is very, very well funded. I'm not sure about Ahoa, but a lot of these associations aren't going to make it, depending on what their ratio of revenues are. Right? If they're getting eighty percent of their revenues from conferences and those aren't happening anymore, mm. that's not that's not a good scenario. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, and a lot of companies were then evaluating. Gee, should we keep paying the memberships because you know that's going to be another another drag on it? So, yeah, but H and is okay because I mean their their mission is to you know lobby and things like, and they're connected to the major ho you know hotel groups and things like that, and that's fine. I mean, there's that whole legislative agenda that's not going to have problems, but a lot of other groups are going to have have real issues. Yeah, yeah. Dean, go uh, ahead. Remember, sharp elbows. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this article earlier this week, and I can't remember which hotel chain it was actually, and I probably could have mentioned them if I did anyway. That's all right. So, but they I'll were doing something where for an extra fee that you could have, that you could ask the hotel, they'd send this little robot in basically with UV light, and they would UV treat the whole room. Uh, but it would cost you extra to do that. Mind you, you couldn't prove if they actually did it or not. You wouldn't have any idea. Uh, but so let's assume for let's assume that that is effective, that it works, that it does something. Would as it would consumers be willing to pay extra for something like that? Some will, of course. So there's Some. always going to be there's always going to be somebody that will pay, you know, for safety or whatever. Uh, it, 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 there's there will always be a market for that, and I'm surprised there hasn't been more, uh, more opportunistic. Uh, people trying to, to capitalize on it. Personally, I think it's suicide. I, 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 I have an answer to that, which is kind of funny. A friend of mine tried to step into the space of doing that for medical offices and uh, places where they would go in and do extra sanitation so that some higher risk patients would feel better about coming to the doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. And the thing that threw it away, and this is typically American, is the doctor's offices realized that they couldn't be liable for somebody catching Absolutely. COVID. Absolutely. So what the heck do we care? Because I can't get nailed with it. And so they didn't care about it. They didn't care about getting extra clean because well, I mean, at the end of the day, they couldn't get sued for it. Yeah, but even if you care about it, even if, you know, like Robert said a minute ago, our, our job in hospitality, our first priority is to, to ensure the safety of our guests and our staff, right? That That's the, that's the, the, the stakes to the table, as he said. So can you monetize it though? Is there a monetary? Well, well, but here's the problem, right? We, we, I'm going to channel my inner Tim as I often do. <laughs> he often says, "When you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck." There's a right. massive shipwreck that happens when you create that ship, right? Mm -hmm. And that is, you're now creating a clean room and a non-clean room, right. or right. a dirty room. So now you're making people, you know, you're turning a, a swath of people off. I think by doing yeah, that. Yeah, but you oh, know what? That, that we've been living with that a whole long time because I have the deluxe suite versus the I got the one yeah, by the I. No, no, that's different. different. Yeah. You're, not, you're not, the deluxe suite isn't cleaner. It has more physical. Yeah, things. but it's more than what I'm getting. At the yeah, end of the day, no, no, no. The, number one, one, the, the number, the number one. Bigger yeah. bed, a smaller bed or a better view. And, and, and let, like that's, that's a, that's something. I'm not going to choose. Based on finances, how safe I'm going to be in a room? I think that that's a bad. But people problem. do that being on first floor, being on the third floor. I don't want to be on the ground floor because something could break in my window. That's number, number, one exactly thing, right number one thing, and we just did a we just did a study on this with Focus Right. Number one thing is cleanliness. Number two thing is hot water. Number three thing, which is closer to those two than you might imagine, but that's uh, kind of understand, is quality internet. Yeah. <laughs> thing, right. Those you those you have to you have to have. It has to be clean, 
right? So, so windows are optional then. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, and I wanted to drill down. We didn't really have the thing in the study. It's like, would would you? How much cleanliness would you trade for quality internet? Are you going to trade ninety degree water, or does it have to be eighty five? What's the what's the well, limit? Well, I'm the quality internet. Yeah, yeah. 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 I told you about the sharp elbows oh. after you get past the guest phase, just so but, you know. But on the time, I'm, tying I'm, I'm into this research, this is all, all good stuff. I'm listening, and this is all stuff we experience at the hotel level, right? Because yeah. I think I think it was Stuart, or maybe Robert said, you know, all of this stuff boils down to staffing, right? Yeah. AHLA, AHOA, everybody can say we need to do this, but if you don't have the staff, you got you know, you got two people cleaning you know twelve story building. Not happening. Or the you training, know, no or the training, or the supervision of it, right? right. Make sure or, or that, that it's or we have a robot is being it. executed, or raise the check and balance that it's happening. Yeah, but and yeah, that's not that's not the point either. I mean, that doesn't happen either. And you know, every so you know, I, I follow all the Ahoa and all that, all the conversations. And for the last few weeks, I mean, there was a time where they were talking about cleanliness, but. I would almost say in the last 12 to 18 weeks, I haven't seen a thing about cleanliness. It's all been yeah, about all been funding, 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 or right. yep. supporting right. funding in some way. And and to take it to the next step, you know, all of these members within the OHA family or membership are, you know, trying to go to the brand and say, you know, don't charge us these fees, mm -hmm. right? So you know, there, there, there is a lot of infighting going on between franchisee, franchisor at this point because you know, the brands can't service or give the full service that they had talked about pre-COVID and the hotels can't pay these fees during COVID. So, you know, who's right? I mean, what, what position right. stands true? But again, yeah. when you when, when you look at the funding they're looking at, if you look at the airline industry, I mean, what the airline industry was asking Congress for, which looked like it was going to get passed for a little while, but it, it didn't, it wound up being nine, what was it, $9,000 per employee. Or something like that. Or no, no, was it nine? No, no, it wasn't nine thousand. It was like ninety thousand per employee because they were saving thirteen thousand or thirty thousand jobs or whatever with these big billions of dollars. That was crazy. Or a hundred dollars per passenger, right? When you kind of looked at this this time frame for it, you go, "Wow, that's a lot of you know subsidy going on this." So yeah, it, there's some crazy, crazy stuff. The thing that came out of this research study, though, because I talked to a lot of the brands and the REITs and the management companies and tech groups and things like that. Um, one of the ownership organizations, I won't be more specific because this is all highly non-disclosed, um, basically said that the pandemic is having them look at do they uh, go, taking Dean's thing of how do you monetize this to the nth degree? Can they now charge for housekeeping to be optional? Right, because they've mm -hmm. trained people because of COVID. We aren't going to have housekeepers in the room for your safety. Kind of the same as we're going to put the little piece of paper. Not do it. No, no, no. We're going to put you. We're going to put the little thing on the pillow to say, "Gee, do you want your sheets changed?" Because for you know, basically to save the environment. Right. Same okay. sort of yeah, yeah, disingenuous. Yeah. You know. <laughs> situation but great. they're basically going to say oh no we aren't going to do it and when they bring it back they're like we are really evaluating can we charge people to get to get housekeeping during their stay right is that a revenue opportunity on top of the resort fee on top of the everything else right and you just yeah. go which is well, different than saying yeah. the room's not clean right it's it's saying you're not getting a specific tangible service during your stay if, if i could right. save a few bucks and not have someone come in and make the bed right I, I would do that every stay but unless I'm staying with my family. I mean, if I'm staying with my family, my wife yeah. is going to want that. Yeah, I'm, really. I'm never going to want it. So. But boy, talk about extending out your cleaning times for you know turnover. Yeah. That's that's well, going to be very interesting. Those rooms are going to get trashed well, out. Going right? back to the association <laughs> conversation real quick just before we kind of wrap things up is they've started to learn how to monetize. Uh, Java, as you pointed out, all that cleanliness content that was supposed to be helpful to the industry is now behind a paywall. Right. If you want to know how we're telling you how to do this and what should be done in best practices, you have to be pay a paying member of us to get that access. Which uh, I think is fine. I think we're That's that okay. I, yeah. I think there was a time in COVID where we were all in the same boat, right? And we had to support each other. 
I, I think we're, we're now, and, and Ed's used this phrase before, we're in the same ocean, but we're in different boats and we've got to look out for ourselves. And, mm. and, and at the end of the day, if they can't be solvent, if, if they're not in existence a year from now, that hurts the industry. Right. So they've got to do what they can to survive. And, and if that means making a profit from content, I, I think that's fine. And it better, yeah. be good, it better be good, valuable content. Yeah, that's not just the, the links to a bunch of public content. articles, right? Because right well, now, I'm not seeing that. I'm not no. seeing valuable content that I need to pay for. You're not the consumer, Lauren. You know? You're not, you're not uh, the... The other associations, I would say, yes, I am that consumer. I need to know that no. I have value to it. You don't, own, you don't own and operate hotels. And you're a lot more that's sophisticated. True, but I do recommend to those that do whether they should. Price. So, yeah. I mean, I got to be played into in that conversation a little bit. Yeah, but if you look, well, I've got forty-five thousand members. Maybe five percent look like you. The uh, the other ninety-five percent are people that don't understand marketing fully. You know, they're just focused on on the hotel, running the hotel, and this is information that will help them do a better job of that. Hey, True, but then again, I, I, so people also I, ask us people, "Do you think it's worth it?" And if I don't think it's worth it, then how will I get renewed? Right, and then then they figure that out. That's what free market does. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I think that they're missing the mark on some of the content. That's pretty much, regardless of whether I'm that person they're selling it to or not, I think they're well, missing the mark on a lot of it. Well, I think Lauren, they're really the content. content, everyone is missing the mark because you're a genius. No, no, well, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Did you say he was a genius or he was associated with a genus? Yeah, I think the other one is more accurate. I think the other one is more accurate. <laughs> or he's wearing jeans. Maybe yeah. that was <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, we're at a uh, two-hour mark. Well, can uh, we talk about Google real quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. Google we'll Analytics. So, because I want to do a shameless plug because I haven't done yeah, one yet. A podcast. Um, so d today's episode that we're going to be recording today, publishing next week of the Fuel Hotel Marketing Podcast, is going to be on the new Google Analytics ah, four. Google four that's just being rolled out. Now, folks that have been paying attention will already be experienced with this. But this is a fundamental change for how Google Analytics works. If anyone's been familiar with how Adobe Analytics works, it's event-driven, it's not session-based. This new version is a lot more like Adobe Analytics. It is phenomenal in terms of what we're gonna be able to track. However, it will require every single website on the entire internet to redo their analytics. Now, current analytics is not going away. Universal Analytics is not going away. This is a new one that will eventually replace it. There's no timeline on that now. But the folks that want to take advantage of this, it's it's still sort of betery. It's it's got some issues that are still getting baked out and it's getting expanded. Some of the reports are, are lacking. But I would I would talk to your web team today about getting Google Analytics for inputs, beginning to get implemented on your website. It's and actually, I called Stuart up last week going, What the heck just happened with Google? Because <laughs> I'm logged in and I was like wait a minute, what's this dashboard? So yeah, I, I was one of those people going, and then I was asking him about you know GTM and GTM is gonna be turned all around differently. The data layering that exists now is gonna be changed to different data layering. Uh, yeah, crazy stuff, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I'm gonna, it's a fundamental oh, rethink. Uh, and the greatest thing of all, and this, this article pointed it out, is people are gonna stop obsessing about the most stupid KPI in the industry in, in any industry is the bounce rate. People are so oh, obsessed with bounce rates on their websites and that, that will go away. See, I was thinking about impressions. I'm sorry, I was thinking, I think that as soon as we get off of this, how many people I flashed in front of, I think would be a good thing. Yeah. But, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Very cool. Well, with that in mind, Mr. Robert, it is a rare pleasure to have you on the show today. If people want to know more about you, Rock Cheetah, and the mysterious Illuminati stuff that you do. Well, wait, you guys don't, yeah, see, you don't cover the boop or the rut row. We don't have to cover the yeah, rut, the rut row. The rut row had to do with the UK anyway, and we've lost Ben and Trish. We lost so our UK contingency. Forget yeah. that. Yeah, forget that. But the boop was very, very good. It's the top 50 bars in the world. Come on. That's yeah, oh, the, okay. and that and that yeah. and that actually looking at the at the analytics and Mailchimp, that is the most clicked on clicked on article. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think a lot of people are looking for good news and bars, all in that kind of combination. So yes, but exactly. if they do want to find you, Mr. Robert, and can find me on social media at, at Robert K Cole or RockCheetah.com. Or to subscribe to the newsletter, it's just Bitly slash RockCheetah, all lowercase. Excellent. Mr. Dean, for those who want to know everything MetaSearch and what it is that you're doing, where can they find you, sir? 
uh, metasearchmarketing.com and or basecampmeta.com or look me up on LinkedIn under Dean Schmidt. And you have another and podcast. Dean, you in the end of year promotion? Uh, uh, sure, I'll plug that in there. So, uh, hey, by the way, one of the things that we're doing is working on a way for small hotels to get live on Google Meta. Uh, you know, big brands and everybody, they've got their tech stacks. They do all that fancy stuff and budgets kind of to do it. Uh, small hotels don't. Well, we figured out a way to make that happen. Uh, where I'm leading with that is if you're interested, reach out to me because we can get you set up on Google Meta for free through the end of the year. By free, I mean free, 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 as in no setup, no monthly, no marketing. Uh, come January 1st, we decide if you want to keep on doing it. All right. Stuart, uh, for your award-winning podcast, and I believe that you are now a current top 25 uh, um, contendee, just saying, <laughs> for HSMAI's top 25 award. Let's make sure they're smart enough to realize that. Um, yeah. Fuel Travel? FuelTravel.com is the mothership, FuelTravel.com slash podcast. Or if you just search for hotel marketing on any podcast platform, we will be number one. And you can listen to 169, soon to be 169. I'm publishing one today. Um, that'll be the 169th episode. So what did we talk about? I can't remember what we talked about last week. Oh, it was converting after the conversion. So mm. the fact that you've got a booking doesn't mean that your job is done because cancellation rates are so high in the industry. What can you do to mitigate the risk of losing the booking after the booking? So that, that will get published later today. And then, like I said, we're going to be doing one on the Google Analytics 4 published next week. So fueltravel.com slash podcast. Awesome. Javid, thank you, one, for being with us at the beginning and describing what it is that Infinito is doing, but also staying us as long and putting up with our contentiousness as to as we go through the parade of stuff. Uh, again, once again, I should say, if people want to know more about you, reach out to you and or know more about what you're doing, where is it they can find you? So they can find me at Javid at infinito, so infinito.solutions.com. Our website is infinito.solutions. Excellent. Pretty simple. I will be doing my podcast day, which will have a minor recap as to the show today, which should be fun. Also, I'm throwing in some new tools and stuff as usual. But if you would like to have a replay of this or any previous 273 episodes of This Week in Hospitality Marketing, you can go to hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live and look for show number 273. And we will be recasting this out as we always do each week in 11 different languages. On Wednesday, we'll be sending out at 1130 a.m. Uh, Sydney time, Sydney Australia time and 1130 a.m. Uh, London time for those for the EU. So we have a little bit more uh, reasonable time zone for everybody in those moments in those areas. So with that in mind, Javid, again, thank you, Stuart, Dean, Robert, and for everyone else, Tris, Ben, uh, Adele, uh, Lily, and Stephanie, please uh, thank you so much for having joined us this week and for everyone else to join us on all the channels. And we'll see everyone next week for show 275, Friday, 1130 Eastern US uh, next Friday. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.